At Sungshu, the Japanese had seized the forward trenches and had begun tunneling towards the fort. The same was happening at Erlung. On October 27th, unknown to the Japanese, whose sapping works were now within 300 yards of Fort Erlung, the Russians had dug a counter tunnel, placed a mine within it, and blew up the earthworks. General Smirnov, with great personal risk, insisted he detonate the explosive personally, after which E.K. Nojina wrote, Above rose a cloud of dust and smoke, out of which projected planks, stones, and bodies. The night of the 28th saw a successful Russian counterattack on the forward trenches of Sungshu and Erlung. However, by 2 p.m. the next day, a Japanese counterattack saw the trenches back in Japanese possession. While the trenches were changing hands, the barrage of the forts had continued. By October 29th, the bombardment had lasted three days. At 12.30 p.m., the guns stopped, and the infantry renewed their assault on the forts. A British observer noted, It was magnificent, and it was war. With the Japanese occupation of the forward trenches, the average distance between the attackers and defenders was only 150 yards. Russian rifles and machine guns, many having survived the bombardment, fixed their sights on the Japanese lines and tunnel exits and opened devastating fire as the Japanese infantry rushed out with bayonets fixed. The British official history notes, The rapports merged into one continuous roar and, seen intermittently through the dust raised by the bullets, the stormers looked like men struggling in rough water. So complete had the Russian preparations been that many Japanese had fallen in the act of climbing out of the trenches. The Russians broke the Japanese assault. One Japanese regimental flag bearer was killed within five minutes of attacking, and one Russian defender even employed a rudimentary flamethrower. Only a few of the Japanese attackers had survived. Unable to budge the entrenched Russian defenders, the Japanese withdrew later that night under the cover of darkness. Some, however, were left behind. Correspondent Richard Berry later spoke to a Japanese soldier who had laid at the base of the forts for two days without supplies. Berry goes on to say that, I asked him, were you thirsty? He replied, by and by very much want to drink, so I make water, red water. With that, he struck his wrist, mimically showing that he had slit one of his veins to quench his thirst. At Atkriti Kaponir II, a position in between the Japanese-held East Panlung and the Russian fort Chikwan, there was intense yet inconclusive fighting throughout the day. As darkness drew close and a Japanese withdrawal seemed inevitable, the Japanese commander of the 6th Brigade Major General Ichinoe decided to personally lead the final attack. In no small part to his presence, the position was taken and renamed Fort Ichinoe. On the topic of counterattacks and reoccupying now Japanese held forts, General Falk compared the positions to a doctor's patient suffering from gangrene. No doctor would torture a patient by attempting to reunite the amputated organs. No commandant should waste his men in an attempt to recapture a position once yielded to the enemy, even though it were abandoned through carelessness. The attack on Fort Erlung, however, had been a disaster. Even if some assaulting infantry managed to survive the deadly gunfire, 
past the wire entanglements and shell craters. They would have been met by the final obstacle, a dry moat. Although the Japanese had brought siege ladders for this eventuality, they were 20 feet too short, which the infantry only discovered under constant gunfire and exploding shells. The mishaps and disaster were to be repeated at Fort Sung Shu. By the night, the Japanese withdrew, having captured Fort Ichinoe and Kobu, a position on the eastern flank of Fort Shikwan. Fort Erlung and Sung Shu stood firm. The cost of such minor gains was appalling, with the loss of 3,611 men and 124 officers dead. During the simultaneous human wave assaults, when supporting artillery fire was insufficient, Lieutenant Sakurai wrote, Our only and last resource was to shoot off human beings to attack with bullets of human flesh. With the precious breathing room now afforded to them, the Russians went about repairing their shelled trenches, parapets, and dugouts, and by October 31st, they were, for the most part, repaired. After another failure to seize the forts, Nogi and the Third Army were demoralized and depressed. A Reuters correspondent remarked, For days after, one had only to look at the slopes of East Chiquan Hill, covered with the Japanese dead and the pathetic sight of two regimental flags still flying far up the slopes, to realize that the second tragedy in front of Port Arthur had occurred. The Third Army was unable to give the Emperor the forts for his birthday, but in a small act of resistance, when the 101-gun salute was fired in the Emperor's honor, the shells fell on Port Arthur. The second major defeat at Port Arthur enraged popular opinion in Japan, and only by the Emperor's personal intervention was Nogi not dismissed. General Kodama, General Oyama's chief of staff, then made his way south to Port Arthur to see to a change in tactics and insist that the Third Army's efforts be redirected from the forts to Hill 203. Nogi, however, would attempt one last assault against the eastern defenses. With the continued efforts of the Japanese engineers to fill the dry moats, and the arrival of the 7th Division, the attack was renewed on November 26th. The fighting was even more brutal than the previous affairs. Attack and counterattack, fanatical assaults and dogged defenses over the same ground which had been fought over for weeks. Russian General Kondratinko went so far as to place sharpshooters in the rear who shot down any defenders who turned around and attempted to withdraw. The Russian lines held, and the Japanese dead piled again. Japanese General Nakamura called for an attempt to take Fort Sung Shu at night. A force of 2,600 men, 1,200 of which were from the newly arrived 7th Division, were instructed to advance in silence to not fire a shot until all ready inside, and to only use bayonets should they come across Russian troops. Nakamura told his troops, The object of our detachment is to cut Port Arthur into two. No man must hope to return alive. Every officer of whatever rank shall appoint his successor. The attack shall be chiefly effected with the bayonet. The officers are authorized to kill those men who, without proper reason, straggle behind or separate themselves from the ranks or retreat. The attack ended in failure, and Sung Shu remained in Russian hands. Following the renewed assaults, a British observer counted 5,933 wounded men and 208 officers.
The dead, though numerous, had yet to be counted. After only a day of fighting, on the 27th of November, the bloody assault was called off. Nogi would not sleep for three days and wrote, I don't know what more I can do. I am willing to hand over the right of command to anyone suitable. Correspondent Richard Berry recalled a conversation between foreign correspondents and Japanese officers. They were discussing. Dr. Nicholas Sin of Chicago in an interview with an American newspaper in which he stated, all the talk of inhumanity which some correspondents are sending out from the Orient is foolish. The Russians are an extremely humane people. As for the Japanese, the worst that can be said of them is that they are a proud people. Frederick Villiers, a British correspondent, responded, The question is not, are the Japanese or the Russians a humane people or not a humane people? It is, are individual men under conditions the most terrible the imagination can devise? Christians or savages? Humane or inhumane? Both Japanese and Russians socially are delightful people. I've lived with the armies of both nations, and their soldiers are delightful and humane. But that is not the question. Now, is it possible for soldiers living as we saw them today, in their own filth, unable to support the wounded, preyed on by stenches from the dead, until battle in which they neither ask nor give quarter is a welcome relief? Can the word humane be uttered in speaking of lives such as theirs? Or can it be uttered of the Russians, driven into a trap, half-starved, night and day in the trenches, confronted by overwhelming numbers, with certainty of no relief, yet defending a lost hope with lives easier lost than lived? Would you be humane under such conditions? I am sure I would not. No, the truth about war cannot be told. It is too horrible. The public will not listen. A white bandage about the forehead with a strawberry mark on the center is the picture they want of the wounded. They won't let you tell the truth and show bowels ripped out, brains spilled, eyes gouged away, faces blotched with horror. Humane warfare. Was there ever put into words a mightier sarcasm? This was all translated for the listening Japanese officers, and Barry describes how no one said anything. Finally, we walked home silently as the sun went down. With the arrival of the cold winter winds, the despised feasting flies, as well as the wounded left exposed on the slopes before the forts, were killed off, and attentions now shifted to Hill 203. Kondratenko correctly assessed the situation and believed Hill 203 would be the next crucial battleground, and so went about shoring up its defenses. Nogi began to bombard the hillsides. The 18 giant 11-inch Krupp siege howitzers fired their 500-pound munitions onto Hill 203 and Akasakayama at a rate of 1,000 shells a day. On November 28, 1904, the Japanese 1st Division left their trenches for an assault on Hill 203. Two battalions attacked the southern peak, one battalion the northern peak, and three companies, Akasakayama. Those on the southern peak had managed to reach the southwest corner of the hill, but were exposed to devastating shrapnel shells from Russian artillery. At midday, the Japanese officers managed to rally the men, and they were sent back up the hill, only to be scythed by machine gun emplacements. At 7 p.m., a Russian counterattack forced the Japanese back to their starting point. Much of the same had happened to the north. 
As the dawn broke on the morning of November 29th, the slopes of the hills were strewn with Japanese dead. The bombardment resumed and fresh attacks were ordered. The results were largely the same. By the 30th, the Japanese 1st Division, in effect, ceased to exist and were replaced by the 7th Division. General Nogi lamented, I often wonder how I could apologize to His Majesty and to the people for having killed so many of my men. Nogi was then informed of the death of his youngest son, Nogi Yasunori, who, at 24 years old, had died having fallen from a rocky slope and suffered a major head trauma during an assault on Hill 203. Nogi's eldest son, Nogi Katsunori, had died during the Battle of Nanshan. When asked what was to be done with his son's body, Nogi responded, Turn it into ashes. The Russian defenders were gaining victory in each minor battle, and the attacking infantry were consistently repelled. However, the conditions inside the Russian trenches were horrific. The 500-pound shells fell and fell again, ripping apart men and trench works. With the scenes described by a witness as a pulp of mutilated humanity. More than once, sailors, now posted on land, began flights of withdrawal. In one instance, Trechikov, recently promoted to Major General, ran out with his arms outstretched, with his sword in hand, and went on to bolster the defenders to return to their posts. He would also award the distinguished medal, the Cross of St. George, on the battlefield for acts of bravery to which he noted, this method of prompt reward made a deep impression on everyone. Hill 203 continued to absorb reserves from both sides. In response, 9,000 men, non-combatants who lived in the town of Port Arthur, were pressed into Russian service. On November 30th, two battalions of Japanese 7th Division vowed to take the hill or not return and set out at 2.30 p.m. Russian machine guns, shrapnel, and grenades, which Trechikov described as freely used and invaluable, with 7,000 being thrown in a single morning, forced the remaining Japanese survivors to retreat despite the support from the artillery. That same day, however, the Japanese managed to gain a foothold on the left flank where they managed to plant a Japanese flag. Trechikov noted, The sight of this flag always filled our men with fury. I knew this, and, pointing to it, shouted to the reserve, Go, and take it down, my lads. And, like one man, our sailors rushed into the work. Twice again the flag was planted, twice more, it was removed. Despite the dogged defense on display by the Russian garrison, General Falk remained pessimistic and saw a futility in the struggle. It's absurd to try to hold out there longer. We must think of the men. It's all the same. Sooner or later, we shall have to abandon it. We must not waste men. We shall want them later. That evening, Japanese General Kodama was informed that Hill 203 was in Japanese hands, and he went to sleep with a burden lifted. As he ate his breakfast the next day, he was informed that in fact the hill was still a Russian possession. Enraged, he leapt to his feet, smashed his plate on the ground, and went looking for Nogi. Kodama believed that if Nogi was dismissed, it would bring shame onto the Third Army and possibly lead to Nogi's suicide. Instead, 
Kodama insisted that the orders would come from himself and that Nogi would listen and carry them out. To this, Nogi agreed. The Japanese finally came to the realization that the frontal assaults were not working. The decision was then made to reduce the hills and forts to rubble through the constant use of heavy artillery. In some small areas, the bombardment was lifted to allow small-scale attacks into the forward trenches. In such areas, there was desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Russians clung to their trenches with the living surrounded by the dead. Trechikov describes a scene wherein a detachment came to make good our losses of the preceding day. The men were placed in the trenches allotted to the reserves and the officers stood looking at the road and the piles of dead lying on it. I suggested to him that he should sit, but the young fellow said he was not afraid of the enemy missiles. Just at that moment, there was a terrific roar, and he was hidden in the black smoke from a large shell that had burst just where he stood. When the smoke cleared away, he was no longer there. The small-scale assaults petered out by December 2nd, but the shells never stopped falling, and Japanese engineering continued digging tunnels and forward trench works. Trechikov was wounded twice and eventually evacuated from the hill for surgery. On December 5th, at 1.45 p.m., the 14th Brigade resumed the offensive on the western slopes of Hill 203. At the same time, a regiment attacked Akasakayama. Both assaults were a success, and by evening on the 5th, Hill 203 was in possession of the Japanese. The advance was made possible through the devastating force of artillery. British correspondent Ellis Ashmead Bartlett described how there have probably never been so many dead crowded into so small a space since the French stormed the great redoubt at Borodino. Another reporter went on to state the sight of those trenches heaped up with arms and legs and dismembered bodies all mixed together and then frozen into compact masses. The expressions on the faces of the scattered heads of decapitated bodies. The stupendous magnitude of the concentrated horror impressed itself indelibly into the utmost recesses of my unaccustomed brain. British observer Ian Hamilton noted, First, the hill had been sliced into numberless deep gashes, and then these trenches and their dividing walls had been smashed and pounded and crushed into a shapeless jumble of stones. Rock splinters and fragments of shells cemented liberally with human flesh and blood. A man's head sticking up out of the earth or a leg, or an arm, or a piece of a man's body lying across my path, are sights which custom has enabled me to face without turning pale. But here, the corpses do not so much appear to be escaping from the ground as to be the ground itself. Everywhere there are bodies, or portions of bodies, flattened out, and stamped into the surface of the earth, as if they formed part of it. And several times in the ascent, I was on the point of putting my foot on what seemed to be dust when I recognized by the indistinct outline that it was a human form, stretched and twisted and rent into gigantic size by the force of some frightful explosion. The effects of artillery meant human bodies were easily torn apart. Japanese soldiers began wearing rags around their arms and legs, imprinted with their names, so that the owners of separated limbs could later be identified. <laughs>
Also, in accordance with Japanese tradition, the Adam's apples of fallen soldiers were removed and sent back to their families. At any one time, the Russians had only 1,500 men on Hill 203, yet they suffered over 3,000 casualties, a testimony to the constant blood transfusion of reserves which passed by the burial mounds and makeshift crosses spread across the hill on their way to the front. For Japan, the position had cost over 8,000 casualties. Like the Russian defenders, reserves were constantly sent in, and those fresh to the field would have passed the dead and maimed on their way up the slopes. The British war artist Henry C. S. Wright described what he saw on Hill 203. Every inch of the ground had been plowed by the projectiles, rocks were ground to powder, and the hill was little more than a great mound of soft, yielding dust. The trenches on the side could scarcely be traced, for they were filled to the level of the ground with Russian corpses, burnt beyond recognition. Such a terrible sight I had never looked upon. Everywhere, scorched faces with hideous death grins looked up at us with unseeing eyes from the awful debris. Following the Japanese capture of Hill 203, an artillery observatory was quickly established, from which accurate fire could be sent in all directions. The shelling of Port Arthur resumed, and the efforts of Japanese gunners were focused on the Russian Pacific Fleet. On December 5th, the battleships Poltava, Retvizan, and Pobeda were damaged by shellfire. On the 7th, the Retvizan and the cruiser Pallada were sunk, and on the 9th, the Pobeda went down as well. The Perez Viet was wrecked, and the cruiser Bayen lay burning. Russian war correspondent E. K. Nojina witnessed the event. The enemy's siege batteries set to work to destroy the squadron, which perished under the eyes of the whole fortress, and the sailors holding the land positions watched, helpless and with sad hearts, as their ships were struck, and one after another, our great giants went to the bottom. From atop Hill 203, General Nogi and Admiral Togo stood together and watched the Russian fleet burn. Satisfied it was now safe to leave, Togo's fleet exited the Yellow Sea and returned to Japan, where they would undergo repairs and begin readying for the arrival of the Russian Baltic fleet. General Falk was heard to have said in response to events, Thank God, that's the end. General Stosel had previously opened communications with Nogi and complained about the inhumane nature of the relentless shelling, with many of the explosives falling into the town. Nogi replied, What I beg to make special mention of is the fact that owing to your persevering and gallant resistance, the number of our stray shots is unavoidably increased, and I, therefore, sincerely regret that our shots may possibly strike unexpected points. Personally, Nogi seemed to have sympathy for his Russian counterpart, writing, I wake each morning worrying about General Stosel and what a hard time he must be having inside the fortress. I feel very much for him and his brave soldiers. Even with the fall of Hill 203, the final destruction of the Russian Pacific Fleet, and, after Lao Yang, confirmation that Kuropotkin would not be coming south to relieve the siege, many in the Russian garrison were ready to continue the struggle. Generals Smirnov and Kondratenko represented those who wished to hold out, with Smirnov stating, 
I cannot allow any discussion with regard to a capitulation before the middle of January, at the earliest. At home, they are just preparing to celebrate the Jubilee of Sevastopol. Our fathers held out for 11 months. We shall not have completed 11 months till January 8. And only then will the son be worthy of the father. He went on to say, when the big gun ammunition runs out, we shall have more than 10 million rounds of small arms ammunition left. When all the ammunition is finished, we shall still have our bayonets. In addition to this, we have sufficient biscuits for more than a month and a half. On the other hand, Generals Stossel and Falk saw defeat as inevitable and wished to prevent further needless deaths. Stossel rebuted, As to the surrender of the fortress, I shall know when that should take place, and I will not permit a street massacre. Stossel then sent a message to Kuropotkin, a friend from military school. Everyone here knows me, Chinese as well as Russians, and they trust me, knowing that the Japanese will never get into the place over my dead body. He went on, Smirnov may well be all right in his way, but he is a professor and not a fighting general. Russian correspondent E.K. Nojina was within the fortress walls and attempted to smuggle a letter to the Tsar pleading for the removal of Stossel. Port Arthur is enabled to hold out only by the effort of Smirnov and his excellent assistant Kondrantinko. When I can give you details, your hair will stand on end. However, there is no evidence that the letter reached Tsar Nicholas. Life was by no means easy for the civilian population of Port Arthur, with one hoping that the time will come when there will be no bearing the inconvenience of the siege, no enduring the unceasing hell of bursting shells, shattering houses, killing unfortunate friends, and tearing huge holes in the ground, to say nothing of the miasma arising from a thousand corpses rotting on the hills and in the ravines around the forts. There were still 3,500 horses inside Port Arthur. Daily rations for the defenders included a quarter pound of horse meat, half a pound of biscuits, and an eighth a pint of vodka. For those suffering from illnesses and injuries, the horse meat was increased to half a pound. Such conditions were not, by any means, comfortable, but were far from starvation. On December 15th, General Kondratenko and six other senior officers were killed by Japanese shellfire. Kondratenko's death dealt a severe blow to the cause of perseverance inside the fort. Smirnov reacted quickly and wished to replace Kondrantenko in command of the East. When he brought the issue to his commanding officer, Stossel, he replied, I have already appointed General Falk in place of Kondrantenko. When Smirnov resisted, Stossel began to shout, The order is published. You should know by now, General, that I never alter my orders. I never alter my orders. General Fox's first act was to half the strength in the eastern forts, having stated, A short time ago, I was in the trenches. My God, what did I not see? The suffering, the wounds, the sickness. Never shall I forget the sights. Who is better or more noble than the private soldier? Who should not let him die for nothing? We should not let him die, unless something is gained thereby. When talking with American correspondent Richard Berry about Port Arthur, Japanese General Kodama declared, I hold it here, in the hollow of my hand. Port Arthur is strong, very strong, but we will take it. We will. On December 18th, from an underground tunnel dug by the engineers, the Japanese detonated a two-ton mine 
under Fort Chiquan. The explosion devastated the defenses as infantry poured in. That night, Fort Chiquan fell to the Japanese. The fighting at Chiquan had seen one of the several examples of Russian women that had disguised themselves as men and fought in the trenches. One such woman had followed her partner from Siberia and was later killed and buried in a mass grave. On December 28th, further mines were detonated under Fort Erlung, and, like Chiquan, the position fell that same night. Despite the losses of two major forts, a number of Russian artillery gunners and what was left of the Navy sent a petition to their superiors stating that the struggle should continue. Stosel, on the other hand, had sent a message to the Tsar. We cannot hold out more than a few days. I am taking measures to prevent a street massacre. On December 31st, New Year's Eve, a series of mines under Fort Sungshu went off and the garrison surrendered by midday. The last remaining major fortress was then occupied by the Japanese. The next day, January 1st, 1905, saw Wantai fall to the Japanese. Russian artillery observers then noticed a man on horseback riding towards the Japanese lines. One jokingly remarked, he must be taking a New Year's greeting to Nogi. In fact, the man on the horse was holding a white flag and a message from Stosel to Nogi. Being acquainted with the general state of affairs in the theater of war, I am of the opinion that no object is to be gained by further opposition in Port Arthur, and so, to avoid useless loss of life, I am anxious to enter into negotiations for a capitulation. If Your Excellency agrees, I would ask you to be so good as to appoint accredited persons to negotiate concerning the terms and arrangements of surrender, and to appoint a spot where they may meet my representatives. That same day, Stossel telegraphed Tsar Nicholas II, Great Sovereign, forgive. We have done all that was humanly possible. Judge us, but be merciful. Eleven months of ceaseless fighting have exhausted our strength. A quarter only of the defenders, and one half of them invalids, occupy almost 18 miles of fortifications. Without support and without intervals for even the briefest repose, the men are reduced to shadows. The decision to surrender was not discussed with Port Arthur's Council of War, but instead decided upon by Stossel, Falk, and the Chief of Staff. Stossel concluded, They will judge me, and they will say whether I ought to have accomplished the heroic but criminal deed of blowing up the fortress. I prefer having a small reputation in military records to having 30,000 human lives on my conscience. Most of the anger was directed upon Falk, seen by many as a corrupting influence on a weak Stossel. Trechikov noted, General indignation against General Falk was apparent and every kind of accusation was heaped upon his head. Delegates of both sides were arranged to meet at Xing at midday on January 2nd, 1905. Within Port Arthur, ammunition was being destroyed and the last remnants of the fleet were sunk so as to not be of any use to the Japanese. Smirnov sent word to Kuropotkin in protest. General Stosel has entered into negotiations with the enemy for surrendering the fortress without informing me and, in spite of my opinion and that of the majority of the commanding officers. E.K. Nojina witnessed how some, our men seemed suddenly to change their natures, all discipline went to the winds, and rioting commenced. Some 
throwing their arms away, went straight down to the town, which became one vast scene of drunkenness and orgy. The shops and stores were looted, and wholesale robbery was the order of the day. The officers, seeing that it was hopeless to try and cope with their men, hid from the maddened crowds. In turn, General Stossel asked for protection from the Japanese. When asked about events by his men, Trechikov replied, Yes, my lads, we have been ordered to surrender, but no blame attaches to the 5th Regiment, and you can with a clear conscience tell each and every one that the 5th Regiment has always looked death bravely in the face and has been ready to die without question for its czar and country. He recalled that, Many of them burst into tears, and I could hardly speak for the sobs that choked me. The Japanese had anticipated around 9,000 remaining in the Russian garrison. In fact, there were 23,491 men and 868 officers still able to fight, as well as 546 artillery pieces. 82,000 shells, and 2.2 million small-arm rounds. A correspondent wrote, There are no signs of privation. The surrender is inexplicable. In contrast to this view, a Russian officer who had managed to escape wrote, Port Arthur falls of exhaustion. Exhaustion not only of ammunition, but also of men who had reached the limit of human endurance. One saw everywhere faces black with starvation, exhaustion, and nerve strain. You spoke to them and they did not answer, but stared dumbly in front of them. Lack of ammunition alone would not have prompted any attempt to arrange terms. When the assault came, they repulsed the enemy with the bayonet. But the men themselves feeding for three months on reduced rations, were so worn that is marvelous they stood the final strain so long. In total, the Russian forts and defenders withstood 35,000 devastating 500-pound shells. As well as those still fighting, there were the sick and wounded. E. K. Nojina described how in the hospitals they lie side by side on the floor, on the bedboards, underneath them, just as they were placed when they came in. The faces are shapeless, swollen, and distorted, and upon the yellow skin are large bruises. Outside it is freezing, inside, in spite of the musty and sickening stench, the cold is intense. On all sides is filth, nothing but filth, and on it, and among it crawl millions of greasy gray lice. The siege of Port Arthur lasted from August 7, 1904 to January 2, 1905, around five months. Russian casualties totaled 12,660 dead or missing, 16,000 sick or wounded, and 24,359 taken prisoner. Japanese losses amassed to 15,400 dead, 44,000 wounded, and 34,000 sick. General Smirnov and General Falk were later both court-martialed. General Stossel was discharged and following military trials, was sentenced to death. The death sentence was later commuted to 10 years, after a couple of which he was pardoned. Smirnov was acquitted of all charges and later testified against Falk in court, condemning him for cowardice. Falk, seeing this as a slight against his honor, challenged Smirnov to a duel with pistols. Smirnov accepted and Falk would shoot Smirnov in the stomach, but the wound was not fatal. 
The Times correspondent William Greener wrote, Russian residents, without exception, were very fond of Port Arthur, and all Russians, and many foreigners, regarded the place with affection. It was symbolic of Russian expansion, of Russian dominion of the Pacific. The Navy revered it. It was their only ice-free port. The soldiers were proud of it. As an impregnable fortress, it appealed to their sense of power. On January 4th, the Tsar's diary entry read, They are all heroes, and have done more than could be expected from them. Therefore, it must have been God's will. Following the fort's capitulation, Nogi wrote to the Army Minister General Tarauchi, The feelings I have at this moment is solely one of anguish and humiliation, that I have expended so many lives, so much ammunition, and such a long time upon an unaccomplished task. I have no excuse to offer to my sovereign and to my countrymen for this unscientific, unstrategical combat of brute force. I thank you heartily for your kind condolences on the deaths of my sons, and I beg you to forgive my long display of military unskillfulness. On January 14th, General Nogi assembled all 120,000 of his men before a shrine built in honor of the siege's dead. In his speech, he announced, My heart is oppressed with sadness when I think of all of you who have paid the price of victory and whose spirits are in the great hereafter. When the ritual was over, the army returned to its campsites, packed, and prepared for the journey north. British correspondent Ellis Ashmead Bartlett concluded of the fighting at Port Arthur, no other nation will repeat the experiment because men could never be relied on to advance under such conditions. As the Russian army retreated from Laoyang, the city was looted and Chinese civilians were made to pay for Russian frustrations. The most notable cases of brutality came from Cossack units. Dugald Christie, a British Christian medical missionary in Manchuria, described scenes where a man was made to lead some Cossacks to a village and, because he could not run fast enough, they bayoneted him. And how, a party of 18 farmers and laborers were accused of being brigands, tied with some ropes to some Cossacks' horses, and made to run the 40 miles to Mukden, during which two of the civilians fell from exhaustion and were killed. Christie goes on to say how, People were killed because they failed to understand what the Russians meant, or because they were unwilling to give up their animals. The city's inhabitants would suffer further harassment by the occupying Japanese army, as well as the Hung Hutzi. British Reuters correspondent Lord Brooke wrote, Seldom has any city been looted by three armies in three days, but... This is what happened at Laoyang. The Russian soldiers also suffered. American observer Colonel Harvard wrote of the hospital transports evacuating the wounded. The groans and lamentations from these vehicles were heart-rending to anyone whose sensibilities had not been blunted by the habit of such scenes. Frequently, men were found dead on arrival. There were also worrying reports over the increase of venereal diseases contracted by Russian troops. Following the Japanese occupation of Laoyang, measures were then taken to combat venereal diseases. British medical attaché William McPherson noted the Japanese policy how each prostitute will be registered, medical examination, will take place on a fixed day each week in order to ensure thoroughness of the examination 
no more than six to eight prostitutes will be examined in one hour or 36 to 40 in a day by one medical officer. McPherson goes on to note of Japanese efforts at hygiene included cremating all Japanese dead bodies, but that, in order not to offend the religious scruples of the enemy, the Japanese do not cremate the corpses of Russians, except in the case of infectious disease. Following the withdrawal from Laoyang, a member of Kuropatkin's staff exclaimed, My heart is sick with him. At Laoyang, General Skobolev would have won or he would have finished the army, for he would have accepted no alternative. My heart is sore with Kuropatkin. British observer Captain Francis Sedgwick wrote of Russian morale, All ranks were heavily tired of the war. Tsar Nicholas was more optimistic and wrote to Kuropatkin, The retreat of the whole army in such difficult circumstances and along such terrible roads was an operation excellently carried out in the face of grave difficulties. I thank you and your splendid troops for their heroic work and continued self-sacrifice. God guide you. When Ian Hamilton asked General Oyama if he was pleased with the results of Lao Yang, Oyama responded, Moderately, the Russians have managed their retreat too cleverly. Around this time, Substantial Russian reinforcements began to arrive in the form of the European First Corps and the Sixth Siberian Corps. In addition to the two corps, as many as ten trains a day were arriving in Mukden, carrying fresh Russian reinforcements, and a number of soldiers wounded at Laoyang were now ready to fight again. Most Russian battalions, however, were still under strength, with some regiments lacking as many as 400 men. By mid-September 1904, the Japanese Third Army was still sieging the defiant Port Arthur to the south, and Kuropatkin held a clear numerical advantage over the Japanese. On September 29th, in an attempt to keep pace with Russian manpower, the Japanese government implemented a number of military reforms. The length of service for second reserves was increased from five years to ten, and for conscript reserves from eight years and eight months to twelve years and four months. These two reforms increased reserves by around 46,000, which the Japanese army was in dire need of given that one in six Japanese soldiers had become casualties in the seven months of fighting. Heavily dependent on Chinese porters for the transfer of supplies, by October 3rd, an additional Japanese rail system leading into Laoyang was fully operational. Ammunition was becoming an issue for the Japanese artillery, with a large proportion of shells being sent south to be fired onto the hills and forts surrounding Port Arthur. As for food, the 1904 Manchurian harvest had been plentiful, which lifted a weight off the shoulders of both armies. If Port Arthur were to fall, it would free up Nogi's Third Army to head north and nullify Kuropatkin's numerical supremacy, and the surprisingly long summer also allowed for snow-free maneuvers. Both considerations pushed Kuropatkin towards action. Looking to capitalize on his regained strength, Kuropatkin ordered his troops to turn around during the retreat to Mukden, proclaiming on October 2nd, the moment has arrived for us to force our will on the Japanese. We will fearlessly advance, firmly resolved to stake our lives in fulfilling our duty to the last. May the will of the Almighty guide us all. The Russians would stop their withdrawal and attempt to halt the Japanese advance. To do so, they headed towards the Shao River, roughly 20 miles south of Mukden. For the upcoming action, Kuropatkin had reformed his army, 
It was now made up of a Western force, consisting of 10th Corps, 17th Corps, and four regiments of Cossacks, and commanded by General Bilderling. An Eastern force with the 1st Siberian Corps, 2nd Siberian Corps, 3rd Siberian Corps, and a division of Cossacks, and commanded by General Stackelberg. And in reserve, the 4th Siberian Corps, 1st European Corps, 6th Siberian Corps, and Mashinko's Cossack Brigade. Kutapotkin also positioned two flank guards and two extreme flank guards on either side of his army. At the same time, Japanese General Oyama also wished to maintain the initiative, stating, I wish to concentrate as much as possible so as to be able to assume the offensive the moment the opportunity arrives. The Japanese had only been reinforced by a single cavalry brigade since Laoyang and held a narrow position 19 miles to the south. From Sun Taitsu on the western bank of the Sha to the Yentai Mines, the Japanese force consisted of the Second Army on the left, commanded by General Oku, and made up of the Third, Fourth, and Sixth Divisions. The Fourth Army was in the center, commanded by General Nozu, and made up of the Tenth and Fifth Divisions. On the right was the First Army, under General Kuroki, with the Guards and Second Divisions. The 12th Division remained behind the 1st Army as a reserve, and Umezawa's brigade was placed on the far right near Pienialupu, believed by some to be misplaced on account of faulty maps. Oyama's general reserves were held back in Laoyang and were made up of only three Kobe regiments and a field artillery brigade. In total, the Russian force numbered around 210,000 troops. The Japanese force numbered around 170,000. The Russian Western force was to advance along the railway and launch a holding offensive, while the Eastern force would implement the main attack by advancing along a 20-mile front through Pienyalupu and on to Pensihu. Despite the Russian force being some 40,000 troops larger than the Japanese, Kuropotkin's overly cautious deployment had done much to lessen this advantage. Given the reserves, rear guard, flank guards, and extreme flank guards, the Western force only numbered around 43,000 men. The Japanese second and fourth armies facing them numbered 69,000. The Eastern Force, which would launch the main attack, was made up of 50,000 men. The Japanese First Army in the East numbered 40,000. The first engagement came in the East as the Eastern Force advanced and made contact with Umezawa's brigade. General Kuroki believed that this Eastern advance was to be the main Russian assault. Oyama thought otherwise and did not react. Later that day, a soldier from the Japanese First Army was searching the dead body of a Russian staff officer and happened to find a copy of Kuropotkin's battle plan, which was meant for General Stackelberg. Oyama now fully understood Kuropotkin's intentions for the battle and decided to launch an offensive in response. On October 7th, Umezawa's brigade withdrew from Pienyalupu to Penshihu. The eastern force pushed on, and Penshihu was occupied by Russian troops that same day. The point was then contested and eventually retaken by Japanese troops on October 10th. British attaché Ian Hamilton was watching the Russian advance. These dark masses began a stately deployment into long, continuous lines which made my heart sink with an impression of resistless strength and of a tremendous impending blow. But now the long lines halted, strange indecision 
They remained motionless 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and then I realized that they were entrenching out of range of the Japanese. In that one moment, all anxiety passed away. The Russians had by their failure to come on parted forever with the moral ascendancy which is the greatest of all the assets of an attack. By October 10th, both sides were engaged along the whole line. The Japanese 5th Division had faced strong Russian opposition and had been unable to advance after 24 hours of fighting. The Japanese 2nd Army was slowly advancing with the withdrawal of the Russian 17th Corps. By October 11th, the Russians had established defensive lines along the north bank of the Shili River. A new Russian center group was formed, made up of the 4th Siberian Corps and Mashinko's Cossack Division. The center group would protect the inner flanks between the eastern and western groups. The 1st European Corps was then positioned behind center group and 6th Siberian Corps put behind the right of Western Group. Inaccurate maps, difficulties in communication, and overcaution slowed General Stackelberg and the Eastern Group's advance. In response, Oyama issued orders for an attack. I desire to drive the enemy at present east of the Mukden Highway towards the northeast. Oyama's plan was for an advance by all three armies and to establish a new battle line between Kwanlinpu and Fengshipu. To achieve this end, the Japanese intended to fight through the center group with the 2nd, Guards, 10th, and 5th Divisions and wheeling the 4th Army to the right. At the same time, the 2nd Army would hold back the Russian Western Force. This was all easier said than done, and through October 11th, the battle still raged. On the night of the 11th, the 10th Division was ordered to advance on the Sanshatsu. At 1 a.m., stacked Kaoling was set ablaze to signal the beginning of the assault. At this point, both sides were wearing heavy winter coats, and distinguishing one another in the darkness was difficult. To remedy this, a brigade commander told his men, Japanese are short, foreigners are tall. There are no foreign attaches with the brigade tonight, so treat every tall man you come across as an enemy. From a fortified village on the way to San Shatsu, Heavy Russian fire rained down on the advancing Japanese, killing the brigade commander. 200 volunteers were then sent on a suicide mission to breach the walls of the village. After the walls were opened up, the entire 10th Division fell upon the Russian defenders, and bitter fighting ensued. Those in front often fell, but eventually the weight of the attack proved overwhelming, and the Japanese overran the houses. The wounded Russian regimental commander was unimpressed by the fact he was surrounded and refused to surrender. Some of his men did so, but many fought on throughout the night. The Japanese had managed to drive their way in between the western and center groups but the advance came with heavy casualties. 1,250 men killed or wounded, and 60 officers. In the east, Stackelberg attempted to break through the Japanese line at the Taling Pass. The first attempt was unsuccessful. The second attempt succeeded, but was then nullified by a Japanese counterattack. On October 12th, with the 10th Division weakened by the fighting over Sanshatsu, Oyama decided to change plans. Instead of advancing through the center, the main Japanese assault 
would focus on the right of Western Group's 17th Corps. In this sector of the battlefield, around 23,000 Russian troops would face 32,000 Japanese. However, Kuropotkin still held a substantial reserve of 50,000 troops and 250 guns. The 1st European Corps, 6th Corps, and the 2nd Siberian Corps had also yet to be committed. In contrast, Oyama had only the 5th Division available for additional maneuvers. Kuropotkin had been waiting for news of a breakthrough in the east. Instead, Stekelberg informed Kuropotkin that The maps in my possession show nothing but a blank space. The country through which we must pass would appear to be as flat as a pancake, but, in reality, it is extremely hilly and hardly passable for field artillery. Following an advance from the south by the Japanese 2nd Cavalry Brigade and 1,200 infantry, Stekelberg decided to withdraw. The attack also forced the cavalry divisions under the command of Samsonov and Lubavin to withdraw. The withdrawals of Stekelberg, Samsonov, and Lubavin exposed the left flank of western and central groups, an area defended by Rennenkampf and his infantry. In later years, Samsonov and Rennenkampf would command Russian forces at the Battle of Tannenberg in 1914, where they would face the German commander Max Hoffmann, who, in 1904-05, was observing with the Japanese forces at Laoyang and Shaho. In the west, the Russian 17th Corps was under fire from the Japanese 2nd Army. The 17th Corps was reinforced by one brigade from 6th Corps. However, the 6th Corps commander declined to assist in strength. 10th Corps was also now placed under the command of Kuropotkin. The bombarded and abandoned 17th Corps then began to withdraw. Then arrived the 219th Yuknov Regiment. They had been assigned as reserves to 17th Corps and were heading towards the front. Members of 17th Corps were astounded to see the reinforcements march directly into the maelstrom from which they had just withdrew. By October 13th, the Japanese 12th Division had taken heavy casualties and was reinforced with a brigade. The Guards Division had been mauled by a counterattack from Stekelberg during his retreat. The 5th Division the last of Oyama's reserves was then transferred to Kuroki's 1st Army in an attempt to cut off the Eastern Group. Lotashan, a key position on Nanshan Mountain in the center, then fell to the Japanese. By now, the Russians were in retreat along the whole line. However, the Japanese 2nd Army had lost a significant number of troops and was exhausted, which gave Bilderling and the Western Group some breathing space. The Japanese 8th Division was unloading at Laoyang, but Oyama had no more reserves left on the field. On the right, the Russian flank guard, commanded by Lieutenant General Dembovsky, and made up of 12 battalions, 16 squadrons, and 32 guns, remained uncommitted. With no major breakthrough, and having committed his entire reserves, Oyama revised his orders again. His troops would now pursue the enemy as far as the left bank of the Sha River. On the 14th, it began to rain as Mishenko orchestrated an effective rear guard and the Russians went about withdrawing. The Japanese in turn occupied a number of former Russian positions. At 7.20 a.m., the Japanese 4th Division took Shahopu from 10th Corps. In response, 
Sixth Corps launched a counterattack, and efforts were made to try and form a reserve force from the dispersed Russian soldiers. Following Tenth Corps' eventual withdrawal under fire, only three Russian-held positions remained south of the River Shaw. Lamantun, Putilov Hill, and One Tree Hill. For the bloodied 219th Yukhnov Regiment, the battle was not over, as they were ordered to advance with their sister regiment on Changlingpu. The two regiments formed up in full view of the Japanese. Bands began to play as the regimental flags flew, and mounted officers dismounted and advanced at 11 a.m. When they were within 300 yards, the Japanese opened fire. Bullets flew and bodies fell. 2,000 men were lost, and the 219th ceased to exist as a regiment. The British official history records, The whole operation was watched with breathless interest and amazement by the men of the Japanese 8th Regiment, who had no difficulty in repelling, with heavy loss, the exponents of these bygone tactics. On October 15th, Oyama issued new orders. I intend to reform the Japanese armies on the left bank of the Sha River in order to prepare to advance to the line of the Hun River. That same day, Lamantun and Putilov Hill were captured by Japanese forces. Oyama went on to send a message to the government in Tokyo. We have defeated the Russian plans and converted an offensive operation into a radical failure. On the morning of the 16th, One Tree Hill was occupied by the Japanese. By that time, Kuropatkin had managed to establish a reserve force of around 27,000 troops. General Gerngross was then ordered to retake Putilov and One Tree Hill with his eastern detachment reserves. In reality, the hills were more mounds than heights, but strategic nonetheless. Having to wait on artillery support, Gerngross decided to launch his attack in the evening. Commander Yamada, defending the positions with five battalions and two gun batteries, was denied his requests for reinforcements over fears of a major Russian counterattack, and so decided to withdraw. At 5 p.m., the Russian bombardment began. Russian General Putilov, the hill's later namesake, was to attack Putilov Hill. General Novikov, with three regiments from 1st Corps, was to attack One Tree Hill, while the 36th East Siberians were to advance on from behind on the right. The Russian troops advancing on One Tree Hill attacked earlier than had been ordered and managed to catch the withdrawing Japanese defenders. By sunrise, the Japanese had withdrawn, and the hills were again in Russian possession. The news was sent to Tsar Nicholas, who then gave the hill its name, Putilov Hill, after General Putilov, and One Tree Hill was rechristened Novgorod Hill, the garrison city of the 22nd Division. The successful counterattack helped boost Russian morale, but the cost was high, at 3,000 casualties to 1,000 Japanese. After more than 10 days of battle, neither side had been able to achieve victory. A stalemate was reached as the temperature fell and both sides dug in for the winter. Oyama wished to bide his time in the hope of further reinforcements from the Third Army still besieging Port Arthur. Kuropatkin had further reinforcements on their way from Europe, with which he could commit to a spring offensive. On October 19, 1904, Tsar Nicholas wrote in a letter to the German Kaiser Wilhelm, 
I will continue the war to the end. That is, to the day when the last Japanese will be dragged out of Manchuria. The Times, on October 20th, wrote, Victory may often rest not so much with the last man as with the last round and the last biscuit. As the winter snows fell and the ground froze, both armies dug opposing trenches, in some cases only a few meters apart. Around 200 miles of trench works would be constructed and fit with barbed wire and mines. The Battle of Shaho, which lasted from October 5th to October 17th, 1904, was indecisive and ended in stalemate. Russian casualties amassed to 41,550, with the Japanese suffering a similar number at 39,769. However, the Japanese would have the advantage in morale, as they had advanced 16 miles towards Mukden, and it was now certain that the siege of Port Arthur was not going to be relieved. Tsar Nicholas sought to improve the situation by recalling Viceroy Admiral Alexeyev and appointing Kuropotkin supreme commander of the Russian forces in East Asia. Released from any politicking, Kuropotkin was free to plan the next stage of the war. The temperature plummeted to a freezing negative 10 Celsius, and many Japanese soldiers ill-prepared for the cold, were struck by frostbite. In the Russian camp, discontent over the handling of the war continued to simmer, and Japanese agents secretly distributed pamphlets calling for reform back home. Supplies also became an issue, with an officer of the general headquarters recalling, General Kuropotkin bitterly complaining of the tardiness in sending supplies necessary to the soldiers, insisting that until there is better organization, military operations are impossible. With the stalemate in the north and Port Arthur still under siege in the south, a second, largely Anglo-American international loan was issued to Japan. On November 14th, Japan received a loan of 12 million pounds, a present-day value of over $1.4 billion at a rate of 6% interest over seven years. As the days and weeks passed with the two armies entrenched and facing each other in the blistering cold, the new year, 1905, arrived, and with it, the news of the fall of Port Arthur. Kuropotkin was aware that Nogi's third army would now be heading north. However, the arrival of 12 Russian trains a day into Mukden had been steadily bringing in reinforcements, which meant even with the addition of the third army, the Japanese would not outnumber the Russian army in Manchuria. Although, there is something to say of the battle readiness of Russian troops, fresh from Europe and having spent four weeks in a train, to Nogi's veterans of a five-month siege. Responding to the impending arrival of the Japanese Third Army, Kuropotkin ordered General Mashinko to conduct a large-scale raid against Japanese communication lines with a force of 6,000 cavalry and six light gun batteries in order to induce the enemy to detach as many men as possible for their line of communications and so weaken their front to handicap supply arrangements and to stop the rail transport of Nogi's units to the front. However, after the Battle of Shaho, much of the ground had been devastated by artillery. For example, during the fighting, 48 Russian guns alone had managed to fire 8,000 rounds in only 40 minutes. 
As a result, the movement of Mashinko's cavalry was impeded. On the first day of operations, January 8th, they covered only 23 miles. Mashinko's objective was to capture Nuchuang Station, blow up nearby railway bridges, and destroy part of the railway between Tashinchao and Kaiping. The slow progress over broken ground permitted the Japanese time to reinforce Nu Chuang, now defended by 1,000 riflemen. The entrenched infantry fought off the cavalry assault, and Mashinko withdrew after losing 62 dead and six wounded, arriving back at the Russian encampment by January 18th. On January 22, 1905, thousands of Russian peasants and workers demonstrated on the streets of St. Petersburg, led by the Orthodox priest Georgi Gapon. They attempted to petition the Tsar to reform working conditions and introduce a national parliament. The crowds moved through the city on their way to the Winter Palace, where they believed Tsar Nicholas to be. In fact, he was out of the city at the time, at the Tsarskoyo Selo, the imperial residence, 15 miles south of the capital. Eventually, the demonstrators came up against military troops and police. The military authorities reacted by firing into the crowds and dispersing the groups with cavalry and sabers. A Reuters correspondent reported, The Cossacks at first used their whips, then the flat of their sabers, and finally they fired. The strikers in the front ranks fell on their knees and implored the Cossacks to let them pass, protesting that they had no hostile intentions. They refused, however, to be intimidated by blank cartridges, and orders were given to load with boar. The passions of the mob broke loose like a bursting dam. The people, seeing the dead and dying carried away in all directions, the snow on the streets and the pavements soaked with blood, cried aloud for vengeance. From the military response, and subsequent tramplings caused by the fleeing crowd. Roughly 200 demonstrators died and 800 were wounded. Madame Kusa, a member of the Imperial Russian Opera, shouted at an army officer on the street, The Japanese you don't know how to kill, but defenseless people at home you kill. The incident became known as Bloody Sunday, and in response, 414,000 workers went on strike throughout the month of January. Capitalizing on the discontent, Japanese forces went about distributing pamphlets in Russian trenches, informing the soldiers of the events back home. It is difficult to say whether the political situation on the home front affected the military situation in Manchuria. However, three days after what many were calling a massacre, Kuropatkin ordered an offensive. Mishinko's cavalry raid had informed Kuropatkin that the Japanese Third Army had yet to arrive, which favored well for a Russian attack. With Grippenberg's chief of staff stating it would be impossible for us to dream of being successful after Nogi's arrival. Kuderpotkin had reformed his forces again. He now oversaw the 1st Manchurian Army, on the left and under General Lenievich. The 2nd Manchurian Army, on the right and under General Grippenberg and the 3rd Manchurian Army, in the center, and led by General Kolbars. Kuropotkin announced his orders. 
Our primary objective is to drive the enemy behind the Taitsu River and to inflict on him as much damage as possible. The Taitsu River being the river running through the city of Liaoyang. General Grippenberg was reinforced by 10th Corps and Steckelberg's 1st Siberian Corps. The 2nd Manchurian Army, now numbering 75,000 troops, would be the main attacking force. Facing Grippenberg would be four divisions of the Japanese 2nd Army under General Oku. In January, the Japanese 5th and 6th Divisions had switched positions with the 5th Division joining the 2nd Army and the 6th Division joining the 4th Army. The 2nd Army was also reinforced by the newly arrived Japanese 8th Division under Lt. Gen. Naobumi. The southernmost point of the Russian line was the village of Changtao and Grippenberg's immediate objectives were the Japanese-occupied villages of Haikotai and Sandipu. Through the frost, wind, and snow on January 25, 1905, the Russian 2nd Manchurian Army advanced. Before the attack, General Grippenberg told his men, If any of you retreat, I'll kill you. If I retreat, kill me. Kuropotkin recalled of the reinforcing of the Russian right that These movements, of course, at once disclosed our intentions, and information soon came in that the enemy had, in their turn, commenced moving their troops westward and fortifying opposite our new dispositions. In the bitter cold, the Hun River was crossed, and after a desperate struggle and mounting Russian casualties, the 1st Siberian Corps took Haikautai. Unable to coordinate with the 1st Siberian Corps and attack the day before, the 14th Russian Division advanced on Sandipu. The second Russian objective on January 26th. The unrelated village of Pao Taitzu was then bombarded and subsequently occupied. Pao Taitzu then came under heavy Japanese artillery fire and a Japanese counterattack was launched from Sandipu. Eventually, Russian forces made attacks on Sandipu, but without success. Kuropotkin was unaware of this, however, as it was falsely reported to him that Sandipu had been taken. By the 27th, thinking Sandipu had already been taken, General Grippenberg moved his heavy artillery away from the village and asked permission for his troops to rest. The request was then granted. Despite orders not to attack, Stackelberg commanding the 1st Siberian Corps, was determined to take the Japanese positions and ordered his troops to advance on the 27th. His efforts ended in a bloody withdrawal and the loss of 6,000 men. The village of Sandipu was one for resting travelers and was surrounded by high, thick walls. By the evening of January 28th, Sandipu remained occupied by the Japanese 5th Division. Grippenberg was determined to maintain the offensive, but after the failed attacks, Kuropotkin refused to send reinforcements and ordered a withdrawal. At the same time, as Kuropotkin ordered the retreat, Oyama ordered a major counterattack aiming to push the Russian armies north of the Hun River. Grippenberg withdrew under orders, and Oyama wrote of the subsequent fighting. We attempted several attack movements, but suffered heavily from the enemy's artillery, and especially from his machine guns. But all columns continued the attack 
with all their might. Our forces charging into Haikotai occupied the palace firmly and entirely by half past nine. The Battle of Sandipu ended in a Russian offensive failure. However, the defensive line still held. Over 20,000 Russian men were killed, wounded, or missing, and Japanese casualties numbered around 9,000. Owing to the effectiveness of machine guns and the advantages of the defense, proportionally speaking, Sandipu would prove one of the bloodiest battles of the war. Over one-third of the Russian casualties came from the actions of the disobedient Stackelberg, who was then relieved of command, and the Japanese 8th Division's first experience of battle resulted in 50% casualties. On January 30th, General Grippenberg, commander of the Russian 2nd Manchurian Army for only seven weeks, asked to be relieved of his command and claimed the reason to be bad health. Kuropotkin recalled of Grippenberg's resignation. This action of his set a fatal example both to those under him and to the rest of the army and was most harmful to all discipline. The opinions also that he had expressed to the effect that the campaign was virtually over, and that we should retire to Mukden and Harbin, had a dangerously disturbing effect on our weaker members. It was, in the long run, more harmful than any single defeat of a portion of our force would have been. When Grippenberg arrived back in St. Petersburg, he gave his account of the battle to the Russian newspaper Novo Vremya. Victory was in our hands, and I cannot tell you how anxiously I awaited men and the authorization to advance. On the night of the 29th, we retired. The men retired unwillingly with tears in their eyes. I decided that it was impossible for me to remain any longer at the front. Rumors also began to spread amongst the Russian troops of the supposedly cowardly actions of the generals Fock and Stosel during the surrender of Port Arthur. The Times described the frustrations of the Russian soldier. They had been told they would beat the Japanese as soon as they had them on the plain. After Lao Yang, they were told they would beat the Makaki as soon as the Kaoling was cut and the little tricksters had to fight in the open, after Sha Ho, they were told that the Japanese could not bear the cold and that they would never stand their ground in a winter engagement. Stalemate was once again reached, and both sides returned to their defenses and trenches for the coming weeks. Mukden, present-day Shenyang, is a Chinese city and the capital of Liaoning province in southern Manchuria. It is located 240 miles north of Port Arthur, 40 miles north of Liaoyang, and 208 miles south of Harbin. Like Liaoyang, Mukden's history stretches back to the 2nd century BC where it served as a border post and trade center between China and the nomadic tribes to the north. After Russia acquired railroad rights in Manchuria in 1897, Mukden became a Russian base of operations in the region and served as the main headquarters of the Russian army in Manchuria during the war with Japan. It was believed that if Mukden was to fall, the Japanese would advance on the Russian city of Vladivostok. As a result, Vladivostok was then fortified in preparation for a possible siege. The Russian army intended to defend Mukden 
and train cars packed with reinforcements arrived daily in the city. By February, Kuropatkin had recovered his losses from Shaho and Sandipu and come to command a massive force, numbering around 275,000 riflemen, 16,000 cavalry, and 1,219 guns. Facing Kuropatkin was an almost equally massive Japanese force which now included the recently arrived Japanese 3rd Army and the recently formed Japanese 5th Army. In total, Oyama commanded 260,000 riflemen, 7,300 cavalry, and 992 guns. The Japanese did manage to accumulate a major advantage in machine guns, owning 992 to Russia's 56. With over 560,000 troops taking part in the struggle for Mukden, it would be the largest battle in world history to date, twice the size of the Battle of Borodino back in 1812. A woman living in Harbin wrote in her diary, the trains carrying troops run without stop, and when one pauses for thought, steps away from the inertia that dictates existence from day to day, and asks oneself, what are these preparations for? The countless medical corps, the enormous, highly organized human mass, transported across one and a half continents, one is appalled at the thought that all this is being done so that people can kill each other. Considering future relations with China, General Oyama ordered that no fighting take place in the actual city of Mukden. February 1905 marked one year of war, and there was a sense that things were coming to a head. The Japanese economy was straining under the task of financing the military, and foreign statesmen, particularly a number in America, did not wish to see an overly triumphant Japan, viewing the empire as a possible rival in the Pacific, and although there were still reserves of manpower to be drawn upon, many in Japanese government believed they would lose a drawn-out conflict, and so sought a decisive victory on the battlefield. For Russia, the Baltic fleet was nearing the end of its journey, and the murmurs of revolution at home following Bloody Sunday meant a Russian victory was vital to sustain hope in the war. The Russian line was established beyond the Shah and Hun rivers, along a 90-mile front south of Mukden. Since defeat at Laoyang five months earlier, the city of Mukden and the surrounding area had been fortified. General Kalbars and the 2nd Manchurian Army were stationed on the plains to the Russian right, in between the Hun River and the railway. General Bilderling and the 3rd Manchurian Army were positioned with the railway to their right and along the Shah River, including Putilov and Novgorod Hills. General Linnaevich and the 1st Manchurian Army held responsibility for the rest of the line, extended until Shinking. General Renenkampf oversaw two-thirds of the Russian cavalry and was to the left of Lineevich, positioned in the mountains. Fighting in the Russian cavalry was Karl Gustav E. Mannerheim, who would go on to command Finnish white forces during the Finnish Civil War, become Finnish commander-in-chief during the Second World War, and President of Finland, Mannerheim had also played a role in the coronation of Tsar Nicholas II back in 1896. 
The Russian reserves were positioned behind, in the center. Under the recently promoted General Kawamura, the newly formed Japanese 5th Army, made up of the 11th Division, 1st Reserve Division, and Port Arthur veterans, was under strength and positioned on the Japanese right, facing the Russian left. Further west was General Kuroki and the Japanese 1st Army. Next in the line was General Nozu and the Japanese 4th Army, whose front extended to the railway. On the other side of the tracks stood General Oku and the Japanese 2nd Army. And to the southwest was General Nogi and the Japanese 3rd Army having marched north following the siege of Port Arthur. As soon as the Japanese 3rd and 5th armies were in position, Oyama ordered the advance to Mukden. Despite the freezing cold, time was of the essence if the Japanese wished to avoid the spring thaw with its mud and overrun rivers. Kuropatkin worked under the assumption that the main Japanese attack would come from the mountains. However, this would not be the case, and the attack from the mountains would in reality be a diversion. Japanese General Kodama, Oyama's chief of staff, would state, I had resolved to attack the Russians by enveloping them apparently in the east, so that they might dispatch their main strength there while our main force was to be directed against the railway enveloping them from the west. Oyama announced, The object of the battle is to decide the issue of the war. The issue is not one, therefore, of occupying certain points or seizing tracts of territory. It is essential that the enemy be dealt a heavy blow. Since in all our battles hitherto, pursuit has been very slow, it is imperative upon this occasion to pursue as promptly and as far as possible. On the evening of February 21st, 1905, Kuropotkin wished to take the initiative and ordered a second advance on Sandipu. Backed by massive artillery and aimed at smashing the Japanese left wing, it was to be carried out by Kalbers and the 2nd Manchurian Army and scheduled for the 24th. On the 22nd, Japanese and Russian cavalry met and fought in the east ahead of the 5th Army. On the 23rd, Kawamura's 5th Army was ordered to attack the Fushun mines by advancing through the mountains. Kuropotkin, chronically misinformed, overestimated the size of the 5th Army and after seeing Japanese divisions which had fought at Port Arthur, falsely concluded that it was Nogi's Third Army. Indecision set in, and on the day of the attack on Sandipu, Kuropotkin had sent a messenger to Kalbers, asking if he thought the attack should take place. When General Kalbers phoned to ask if the general reserve would be used for the attack on Sandipu, Kuropotkin spoke of the fighting against the Japanese 5th Army. Not a bayonet will be sent. Alexeyev is hard-pressed. The 1st Siberian Corps was then detached from the 2nd Army and sent east to reinforce the left flank of the Fushun mines. The understrength 5th Army fought recklessly in an effort to draw as much attention upon itself as possible, and at this point was facing 42 Russian battalions and 128 guns. With the Russians committing to the east 
a general advance was ordered all along the Japanese line. On the evening of the 26th, General Sakharov, Kuropatkin's chief of staff, said in a memorandum that he believed the main Japanese concentrations were in the center and west. On the 27th, Japanese artillery began shelling Putilov and Novgorod hills. 108 guns in total, including six 11-inch siege howitzers, recently arrived from Port Arthur and now attached to Nozu's 4th Army. Japanese fire was inaccurate, and the Russians had effectively fortified the hills and sustained few casualties. However, there was the psychological impact from the monstrous shells, with one Russian officer stating, It is impossible to hold the line now. Our position is untenable. This was not the case, and the line firmly held. Although the conditions for the entrenched soldiers was difficult, as an observer wrote that the defending Russian troops must patiently lie on the cold ground under fire day by day. In most cases, they might not even rise to a sitting posture to warm themselves by flapping their arms without being made the target for a dozen rifles. Kuroki and the Japanese First Army pushed forward and linked up with the left flank of the Japanese Fifth Army. The advance, however, came with heavy casualties. Kuroki wanted to press on further, but his request was denied. As an observer wrote, Oyama did not consider the sacrifices that this would entail warranted. With slight advances in the east and a holding center, the Japanese grand maneuver began in the west. On the 27th of February, General Nogi and the Third Army advanced to the northwest, heading towards the Lao River. At 11 a.m. on the 27th, Cossacks on the Russian right spotted Japanese cavalry from the Third Army. Further sightings of Japanese forces were later reported to General Kalbers. In response, he ordered two cavalry regiments and a horse battalion to head to Sin Mintun, 45 miles northwest of Mukden, to assess the situation. A second, smaller cavalry force, made up of two squadrons and four guns, was sent to harass the Japanese advance. However, given the size of the Third Army, the opposition was negligible, and the Japanese continued to advance around the western flank. General Oku and the Second Army then advanced on Kalber's Second Manchurian Army. The attack was spearheaded by the Japanese 5th Division and aimed at preventing Kalber's from redeploying his troops. On the 28th, Putilov and Novgorod Hills were still under bombardment and a Russian ammunition dump near the railway exploded. By March 1st, the Japanese Third Army had reached Tsin Mintun. Having committed to an extended 90-mile defensive front and with the battlefield strewn with wreckage, exhausted Russian troops found it difficult to be redeployed. The Japanese had assumed that the Russians would defend one flank and attack on the other. However, with the stalemate in the east and the lack of response to Nogi's Third Army in the west, it was clear that the Russians would defend on the entire front. General Kodama predicted that the result of the battle would be far greater than had been anticipated. It was never thought possible by us that we could surround the Russians and bring about a second Sedan. Referencing the decisive Prussian victory over the French in 1870. On March 2nd, 
a major blizzard descended, which further hindered redeployment while providing the Japanese with cover as they advanced. The blistering cold, however, was unwelcomed by all. At the same time, Kurapotkin, having drawn reserves from Bilderling's 3rd Manchurian Army, was able to launch an effective counterattack against the Japanese 3rd Army, slowing down the advance and hindering Oyama's plans. In the east, Renenkampf and the Cossacks held off the Japanese 5th Army. On the 3rd of March, however, supply columns from Fushun failed to arrive with shells and ammunition. Realizing the situation, a Japanese attack was successfully launched on a key hill that dominated the sector. In response, the Russians rallied, with bands playing God Save the Tsar, and even support staff, such as cooks and clerks, taking part. They counterattacked and retook the position. The Japanese 1st and 4th armies were able to occupy the southern portions of Putilov and Novgorod hills, but for all intents and purposes, the fortified positions remained steadfast. With Nogi's progress slowing, Oyama committed his last reserves to the attack in the west. By March 4th, the Japanese 2nd and 3rd armies had managed to link up at Likwanpao, just west of Mukden. Kalbers was ordered to launch a counterattack. However, with the line threatened, the attack was delayed until March 5th. General Kalber formed for a counterattack. The 1st Siberian Corps was reformed and strengthened by a number of detachments. On the right, General Gerngross stood with 48 battalions, the 26th Division stood in the center, and on the left, a further 32 battalions and 199 pieces of artillery would support the advance. The order to attack was given at 2 a.m. General Tserpitsky of the 10th Corps addressed his troops. Men of Minsk, then lowering his tone, Children, Russia always conquers. We will conquer now. Advance and sweep these Japanese pagans to hell. There will be no retreat, no coming back. The advance was slow, and the counterattack's impact was dulled as battalions were shuffled from Gerngross to shore up the other sides. The Times wrote, There were no less than 16 detachments fighting isolated actions in this part of the field, many of them having received special instructions direct from Army headquarters. Several Army Corps commanders found themselves without troops and unable to exercise any control upon the course of the battle. This situation had been caused by the hasty manner in which attempts had been made to stem an attack against which no prior precautions had been taken. Kudopotkin, while talking to Bilderling on the phone, stated, The Second Manchurian Army is not acting energetically. Its orders are wretched. And when reviewing the reports for the whole day's fighting, concluded, Very little had been done. On March 6th, Oyama predicted that if a full-scale Russian retreat took place, then the Japanese Third Army would likely be overwhelmed and destroyed. To prevent this, Oku and the Second Army were ordered to attack in an effort to pin down Russian forces. The Japanese were seriously bloodied, and of the 5,500 Japanese that took part in the offensive, 4,200 were killed or wounded. That afternoon, Kuropatkin decided that the 1st and 3rd Manchurian armies were to pull back, leaving only a strong rear guard.
During the night's patrols, Nogi's third army had managed to cut across the main railway line leading out from Mukden. Kuropatkin then informed St. Petersburg, I am surrounded. This was not the case, and the railway was retaken by the Russians after savage fighting. However, the event reflected the very real danger of encirclement. To deal with this threat, Kuropatkin decided to personally lead a counterattack against Nogi's third army. To do this, he would repeat a tactic employed at the Battle of Laoyang. Kuropatkin would withdraw his troops and set up new defensive positions along the Hun River. With his defensive line shortened, freed up troops could then be mustered to execute a counter move. On the night of March 7th, Bilderling and the 3rd Manchurian Army and Lenievich with the 1st Manchurian Army were ordered to withdraw. Having held the line for 10 days of brutal fighting and constant bombardment, the orders came as a shock. They were, however, unaware of the danger to the railway and followed their orders. A number of soldiers wept as they withdrew from the positions littered with Russian dead. At 12.20 a.m. on March 8th, Oyama declared, I intend to pursue in earnest and to turn the enemy's retreat into a rout. Kuroki then issued orders to the First Army. The enemy in our front has begun to retreat. The army is to press the enemy to the utmost. Kuroki then ordered his divisional commanders to charge the Hun River, even if they were to lose half of their men in the attempt, with the possible goal of cutting the Mukden Fushin railway line by the end of the day. Luckily for the Japanese, the Shah River was still frozen, and infantry from Kuroki's 1st and Nozu's 4th armies could cross the river and continue fighting. This constant harassment meant that Russian troops never had an opportunity to disengage and reform. Eventually, the ice was broken up and pontoon bridges were required for follow-up Japanese troops and guns, giving the Russians some breathing space. At the same time, the Imperial Guard Division of the Japanese First Army was able to head west and begin closing the ring developing around the city of Mukden. The Japanese Second Army had overrun positions southwest of Mukden and, supported by the Fourth Army, had managed to open a gap in the Russian line. At the same time, the Japanese Third Army had begun attacking the railway to the north and positioning themselves to block a Russian retreat, with Oyama writing to Nogi, The Long Serpent must not be allowed to escape. Having only managed to muster 12 battalions and now facing encirclement, Kuropatkin's planned counterattack was now void. The almost two weeks of constant fighting, troops moving east and west, supplies moving north and south, and now withdrawals and enemy advances, the Russian line began to destabilize. Irish correspondent Francis McCullough wrote how some Russian troops in the rear began to loot and partake in drunkenness. He noted how Great scenes raged round the vodka cases. The barrels had been stabbed with bayonets and hacked open with knives and swords and axes till they bled from scores of wounds. A frantic crowd of men struggled round these openings, seeking to apply their mouths to them or to catch the precious liquids in cups, cans, empty sardine tins, and even the cases of the Japanese shells that were falling conveniently around. On March 9th, a massive and violent dust storm descended on the battlefield. Visibility inside Mukden fell to a few feet and along the front only to a hundred yards. With the enemy closing in, 
shells falling ever closer, and, by chance, a dust storm nearly blinding everyone involved. At 6.45 p.m. on March 9, 1905, General Kuropotkin ordered his forces to retreat from Mukden. At 11 p.m., eight trains with 400 carriages in total filled with wounded artillery, ammunition, and supplies left Mukden Station. Another procession left at 4 a.m. and a third by sunrise. While the trains headed north, Russian troops went about burning the remaining supply and ammunition depots. The black smoke mixed with the dust storm and engulfed the city. At 7 a.m., the massive steel bridge over the Hun River leading to Mukden was blown up. Francis McCullough wrote of the news of the retreat, No wonder our faces paled with superstitious awe when we heard that funeral note. It was the death bell tolling for the loss of Mukden, the passing away of Russia's great empire in Manchuria, nay, who knows but that it was the death knell of the Russian army itself. By midday on March 10th, the dust storm had subsided. The Japanese were now threatening Tawa, six miles north of Mukden, and Oku's second army, closing in from the south, had begun firing artillery into the densely packed Russian ranks. For the withdrawing Russians, only an eight-mile corridor remained open. As the Japanese shells fell, 10,000 Russian soldiers ran for cover in a nearby ravine. General Serpitsky and another, General von der Lonitz, attempted to rally a force to engage as a rear guard. Serpitsky was wounded in the leg but continued to organize the defense. A third general was then captured by the Japanese and eventually reinforcements arrived. Serpinsky would later die from his wounds. McCullough described how. About a square mile of ground seemed to have strewn, thick with old mess, tins, overturned carts, canteens, boots, socks, dead horses, bags of flour, rifles, bayonets, cartridge clips, and cartridges. Kuderpotkin then ordered the second Manchurian army to form a rear guard, while the Russian third and first armies withdrew to Tailing. At that time, the Japanese fourth army had broken through the line and had managed to cross the Hun River. The Times, describing the Russian second army, noted, All tactical control had been lost before the retreat began, and the army followed the stream of fugitives in mobs and groups as best it might. The Russian armies were scattered in the hills as sheep having no shepherd. Companies, battalions, regiments, and even brigades disappeared from their commanders and from each other. Japanese fire continued to pour into the retreating Russians. One Russian colonel refused to dismount his horse, and he was shot through the head. General Kalbers, exhausted, had fallen from his horse and had broken his collarbone. He then overheard an officer asking for the position of the 7th Regiment. The general responded, The 7th Regiment, I do not know what has become of my whole army, and he asked me where my 7th Regiment is. The Japanese were able to continue firing into the Russian masses, and the 2nd and 3rd Manchurian armies had disintegrated. Writing of the Mandarin Road, Dr. Vereseyev, who had left with a Russian hospital unit, wrote, The torrent of cars, wrapped in dust, slowly moved on, stopped, stood still, again began to move, at narrow turns of the road, when entering a village or near the bridges, the confusion became intolerable. Ten rows of cars could not get by at once, and they hurried on and tried to cut each other out, came in conflict, and were in each other's way. The red, savage faces slashed through the dust, 
and the sounds of blows, the swish of whips, and hoarse curses could be heard. As always, the authorities, forever annoyingly present when they are not of need, were absent here. No one in command gave orders, and the carts struggled on in the rear. The jam was terrible. New baggage trains kept pouring from the crossroads into the Mandarin Road. In the rear, the cannon thundered in a broad semicircle, and the rifle discharges rattled. However, General Lenevich and the First Army were withdrawing in good order through Fushun. By now, the Japanese armies were a spent force. After sustaining heavy casualties in order to reach the city, they were now under strength and incapable of delivering the decisive blow. The second sedan, as at Laoyang, failed to materialize. Order began to return to the retreating Russians. Kudapotkin was able to organize two rear guards to protect the railway, and a third held the Mandarin Road open. As supplies and some wounded were abandoned by the wayside, the Russian army left Mukden. At one point, a caravan made up of the 25 members of the Mukden Russo-Chinese Bank was spotted, carrying with them 250,000 rubles and a piano. Given that a number of wounded had been left on the field, some of the Russian soldiers were enraged that the staff saw it fit to evacuate the piano. The caravan was then set upon by the soldiers. Some guards were killed, and money was stolen. On March 10th, General Oyama sent a message to Tokyo. Today, at 10 a.m., we occupied Mukden. Our enveloping movement, which has been proceeding since several days, has completely attained its objective. This was not entirely the case. Mukden had been occupied. The Japanese had gotten their closest to an encirclement, and the Russian retreat was its most chaotic yet. But, in spite of the panic, the Russian army in Manchuria, however battered and depressed, still existed and was marching north. The price of the Japanese victory was not cheap. Over one quarter of Japanese troops engaged in the battle became casualties. 15,892 officers and men were killed, and 59,612 were wounded. The Russian army had lost over a third of its troops in the battle, 20,000 dead and missing, 49,000 wounded, and 20,000 captured. Previously, Russia's largest battle had been at Borodino back in 1812, which had lasted 12 and a half hours. The Battle of Mukden had the most combatants in world history and had lasted over two weeks. In terms of ammunition, the Japanese side alone fired 20.1 million small arms rounds and almost 280,000 artillery shells. The scale of conflict was growing ever larger and represented a troubling omen for war in the 20th century. Concern over a possible Japanese follow-up attack led the Russians to burn down Taeling and continue to march 10 days north to new defenses at Sipinkai. Following the Russian defeat, General Kuropatkin stepped down and relinquished command of the Manchurian armies. He would be replaced by General Nikolai Lenevich of the 1st Manchurian Army. Originally, Kuropatkin was to return to Russia, but he pleaded his case and was allowed to remain a general in the field, now commanding the 1st Manchurian Army.
I may not be a good general, but I am at least as good as some of my corps commanders. When he arrived at Siping Kai, he was given a hero's welcome by the surviving troops. Writing of the defeat back in St. Petersburg, Tsar Nicholas wrote in his diary, It is painful and distressing. With another Japanese victory came a third international loan. On March 24th, Japan received the massive amount of 30 million pounds, a present-day value of over 3.6 billion dollars. With ever-growing confidence in a Japanese victory, the interest rate was lowered from 6% to 4.5, and the duration of repayment increased from 7 years to 25. Following the Battle of Mukden, Russian ambassador to the United States Arthur Cassini spoke to the American Secretary of State John Hay about Russia's tremendous sacrifices and misfortunes. Secretary Hay then asked, When will come the time of your diplomats? To which Cassini replied, We are condemned to fight. We cannot honestly stop. Unlike Japan, where the combined fleet headed by Togo and stationed in the Yellow Sea represented almost the entirety of the Japanese navy, Russia's navy, like its empire, spanned the globe. Russia maintained fleets not only in the Pacific, but also in the Baltic and Black Seas. Almost five months into the war, by June 1904, Russian Admiral Makarov had been killed, and a bruised Russian Pacific squadron remained trapped in Port Arthur. Japanese troops had landed on the Laodong Peninsula, and Russian troops had withdrawn from Nanshan, opening the way for a Japanese advance on Port Arthur by land. On the 20th of June, 1904, the decision was made to send the Russian Baltic fleet to the Pacific. The fleet would engage the Japanese, destroy their navy, and relieve Port Arthur. Zinovoy Petrovich Rojasvinsky was born in 1848, the son of a doctor in St. Petersburg. Aged 17, he joined the Imperial Russian Navy and graduated the Naval Academy in 1868, and the Mikhail Artillery Academy in 1873. As a lieutenant, Rojasvinsky commanded a torpedo boat during the beginning of the 1877-78 Russo-Turkish War, and later as a senior officer on the cruiser Vesta, during which he was awarded the Order of St. George for his actions against a Turkish ironclad. After the war, he admitted that he had falsified his reports of the engagement. However, his career remained intact, and he joined the Bulgarian Navy as an advisor, reorganized the gunnery section, and developed a defense plan for the Bulgarian coast. From 1891, Rojasvinsky spent three years as a naval attaché in London. In 1894, he began serving under Admiral Makarov in the Russian Mediterranean Squadron and, in 1898, was promoted to Rear Admiral and commanded a gunnery school in the Baltic. During a naval review in 1902, in honor of German Kaiser Wilhelm II, Rojasvinsky had put on an impressive performance of his gunnery skill, to which the Kaiser responded to the Tsar, I wish I had such splendid admirals as your Rojasvinsky. Rojasvinsky was notorious for his temper and had a tendency to throw his binoculars overboard when in a fit of rage, earning him the nickname Mad Dog, although never to his face. That same year, 1902, saw Rojasvinsky promoted to vice admiral and chief of the naval staff. 
two years later, in 1904, he was appointed commander of the Russian Baltic Fleet, now the Second Pacific Squadron, and tasked with facing the Japanese in the Pacific. It was noted by a contemporary that Rozhetsvinsky's staff would tremble before him like thieves before the constable. He treats them worse than a bad master treats servants. He was, however, no less strict with himself, working 18 hours a day for weeks on end. The historian Konstantin Pleshikov described the admiral as the right man for the job, for it would take an iron-fisted commander to sail an untested fleet of brand new battleships and new untrained sailors on the longest coal-powered battleship fleet voyage in recorded history. From the decision to embark in June 1904, preparations were being made for the 18,000-mile journey to Port Arthur. Mines, ammunition, shells, and torpedoes were collected, and food was loaded, including herds of live cattle, dried biscuits, vegetables, and vodka. Clothing for both extreme heat and extreme cold were also secured. For such a long journey, the biggest issue facing the Russians was fuel. The ships of the day ran on coal, an inefficient and heavy fuel. It was predicted that the fleet would require 3,000 tons a day to run at cruising speed, and up to 10,000 tons at full speed. And so, tons and tons and tons of the dusty black stuff was piled in and onto the ships. Captain Young of the Oral wrote, What are we to do? What on earth are we to do? I never heard of such a thing. How can I possibly keep the ship clean with a thousand tons of coal lying about in odd corners? Unlike the other European powers, Russia had no overseas colonies from which to resupply during the voyage. Also, under international law, it was illegal for ships of combatants to stay in neutral ports, as was seen at the Battle of Chamulpa. However, given the large sums of quick cash to be made from allowing the Russians to recoal, many nations would open their ports for the day. In accordance with the Franco-Russian alliance of 1894 and a France eager for Russia to finish with its business in Asia to focus on Europe and Germany, the French government would permit Russian ships to use their ports in Africa and Asia to resupply from. However, given the legality of the actions, usage was limited to one day at a time, and so Rozhetsvinsky's fleet would resupply from one port with enough fuel to last until the next port. In addition to France, Germany, who also had interests in China and was happy to see the Baltic fleet leave European waters, offered their colonial holdings to be used as well. In addition to this, the German shipping company Hamburg America Line provided 60 colliers, cargo ships designed for the transport of coal, to help lighten the burden placed on the fleet. The Russian 2nd Pacific Fleet would be divided into three divisions. The 1st Battleship Division would be commanded by Rozhetsvinsky and consisted of the battleships Oral, Alexander III, Borodino, and Suvorov, Rozhetsvinsky's flagship. Admiral Felkerzam would command the second battleship division, made up of the battleships Osilabia, Sisoy Veliki, and Navarin. The first cruiser division included the Dmitry Donskoy, Svetlana, Zimchung, Aurora, and Nakhimnov and in support were a range of auxiliary craft, including the repair ship Kamchatka, as well as nine destroyers, 
All in all, the Russian 2nd Pacific Squadron numbered 42 ships and 12,000 men. It would take three months of preparation before the fleet was ready to depart. In that time, the packing of supplies would overload the ships, increasing their weight and lowering their speed. The mismatched nature of the different classes of ships also meant progress would be restricted to nine knots, which, in the words of Nicolas Clado, a Navy captain and correspondent who had himself championed the use of a massive fleet in an effort to overrun the Japanese Navy, noted, terribly impeded the squadron in maneuvers. Ongoing tensions with the Ottoman and British empires would mean that the ships of the Russian Black Sea Fleet and their experienced crews would be unable to join the Pacific Squadron and instead remained stationed in the area. With the Baltic ships frozen in port half of the year and many fresh-faced recruits conscripted into service, the sailing quality of the fleet was significantly compromised. On a rainy day on October 9, 1904, as the Battle of Shaho was being fought and Port Arthur was held under siege, Tsar Nicholas II went aboard seven warships and gave speeches to his departing men against the insolent Japanese who had troubled the peace of Holy Russia. I wish you a victorious campaign and a happy return to your native land. Captain Bukvostok of the Alexander III was more solemn. We know why we are going to sea. We also know that Russia is not a sea power and that the public funds spent on ship construction have been wasted. You wish us victory, but there will be no victory. But we will know how to die, and we shall never surrender. Rozhetsvinsky was no more confident. What success can there be? We should not have started this hopeless business, and yet, how can I refuse to carry out orders when everybody is so sure of success? The fleet's chief engineer, Evgeny Politovsky, would write to his wife, Such gloom overwhelms me that I feel inclined to hang myself. On October 15, 1904, 28 of the major ships had assembled at the port city of Libau in present-day Latvia. Admiral Rozhetsvinsky then ordered the Russian 2nd Pacific Squadron to set sail. Some of the other smaller ships were not yet ready to embark, and it was planned for them to meet the main force at Madagascar off the coast of East Africa later in the journey. From the Baltic, the fleet made its way through the Danish Straits and, after recoaling at Skagen in Denmark, went on into the North Sea. The days since departure had been slow going but without any serious issues. Only a collision between the destroyer Beastry and the battleship Osliabia, which damaged the Beastry. The torpedo boat Prozor Livy also ran aground, and the Oral damaged its rudder, all resolvable issues. Yet, anxiety pervaded throughout the ship's crews, and tensions were high. Rozhetsvinsky had ordered the fleet on high alert and to be divided further into six divisions. There were reports of Japanese torpedo boats, as many as 100 in the North Sea. The enemy ships would be close to Allied bases in Britain, and the Japanese Navy was seen as not above underhanded tactics, as demonstrated by the surprise attack on Port Arthur. Chief Engineer Politovsky noted, We all sleep in our clothes and all guns will be loaded. And that? We must be on our guard. Panic prevails on board. Everyone examines the sea intently.
On the night of the 21st of October, the fleet was making its way through the Dogger Bank, an area of the North Sea 60 miles east of the British Isles. There was a heavy set fog decreasing visibility and preventing coordination between crews. The ships blared their sirens in an attempt to stay together, but it did little to help. The repair ship Kamchatka had become lost in the mist and broke contact. As darkness set in, past midnight, now the 22nd, Kamchatka finally signaled the fleet with a dreadful message. Chased by torpedo boats. Panic then ensued. The Suvorov replied, How many? From which direction? The Kamchatka confirmed, About eight from all directions. The sea was lit up with searchlights, and the fleet's heavy guns unloaded onto the enemy in all directions. The Oryal alone fired around 500 shells. Hit by friendly fire, the chaplain of the Aurora lost his hand and subsequently died, becoming the first casualty of the 2nd Pacific Squadron. Despite the loss of the chaplain, the enemy ships were neutralized. Politovsky again noted, A small steamer was rolling helplessly on the sea. One funnel, a bridge, and the red and black paint on her side were clearly visible. First one, then another projectile from our ship struck this unfortunate steamer. These steamers, however, were not Japanese torpedo boats. Politovsky continues, They were, no doubt, fishermen. The supposed Japanese torpedo boats were, in fact, British fishing vessels from the nearby port at Hull. The British fishing vessels had been decimated by the Russian fleet, with one Joseph A. Smith witnessing his father and shipmate both headless and limp in a pool of blood. One of the British fishermen later recalled, Me and the rest of the crew held up fish to show who we were. I held up a big flatfish. My mate, Jim Tozer, showed a haddock. When Rozhetsvinsky realized what had happened, he immediately ordered the ships to cease fire. When a six-pounder gun continued to fire, he stormed over and grabbed the gunner by the shoulder. How dare you? Don't you see the fishermen? Without stopping, the fleet continued southwards towards the English Channel, and most of the sailors were elated under the impression they had just won a decisive victory against the Japanese. The false belief that there were Japanese torpedo boats in the area likely came from three sources. First was the Japanese Baron Motohiro Akashi. Before the war, Akashi had served as a military attaché in St. Petersburg, where he set up an espionage network that ran throughout Russia and Europe. Following the outbreak of war, he relocated to Stockholm and continued gathering intelligence and spreading disinformation and rumors throughout Russian circles. During the war, Akashi was given a budget of around 750,000 yen, roughly 156 million present-day dollars. With this money, he went about funding anti-Tsarist groups. In July 1904, with the help of the Finnish independence activist Koni Ziliakis, a conference was convened in Switzerland for revolutionary Russian exiles. A number of groups refused the Japanese money, but in the end, 13 anti-Tsarist groups attended the conference. Ziliakis wrote that, Half the people to whom Japanese money is distributed don't know where it comes from. The other half don't care. As well as the Swiss conference, Akashi went about funding and arming separatists in Finland, Poland, and Turkestan, as well as Russian Marxists, including Georgi Plekhanov and Vladimir Lenin. 
On Lenin, Akashi observed, Lenin is considered by other socialists to be a rascal who uses all kinds of methods to reach his objectives. On the contrary, he is a sincere man and lacks egoism. He gives everything to his doctrine. Lenin is the person who can accomplish the revolution. Although, Akashi also stated that, All the so-called opposition parties are secret societies where no one can distinguish opponents of the regime from Russian agents. During his time in Stockholm, his letters were also being intercepted by the Russian secret police, the Okranka, and so the impact of Akashi's actions are difficult to determine. A second possible cause of the Japanese torpedo boat panic was Abraham Heckelman, an Okranka agent stationed in Copenhagen. He was tasked with informing the Russian Navy of any Japanese ships in European waters. He and his circle received generous payments from the Tsar's government, obtaining the majority of the 300,000 rubles spent on information in the region. It's possible that the numerous sightings of Japanese ships that came from Heckelman and the others were overly cautious efforts attempting to justify their salary. A third possible reason for what was called the Dogger Bank incident was that most of the ships were manned by raw recruits. It is easy to imagine that tensions on board were high and that unknown dangers occupied the minds of many. One crew member recalled thinking that Japanese spies were everywhere. They were watching upon every maneuver of our squadron with the aid of submarines, balloons, and neutral cargo vessels. They allegedly laid mines along the shores of the Netherlands. Some people swore that they had observed the Japanese destroyers stationed secretly in Dutch and British seaports. While the Russian fleet continued southward, the battered British fishing boats returned to Hull. The news of the attack spread quickly, and that same night, the city's member of parliament headed for London. By morning, the Times published, It is almost inconceivable that any men calling themselves seamen, however frightened they might be, could spend 20 minutes bombarding a fleet of fishing boats without discovering the nature of their target. It is still harder to suppose that officers wearing the uniform of any civilized power could suspect they had been butchering poor fishermen with the guns of a great fleet and then steam away without endeavoring to rescue the victims of their unpardonable mistake. The British public and much of the government were outraged, and there were demonstrations at Trafalgar Square and the Russian embassy. King Edward VII donated 200 guineas to the victims and referred to the incident as a most dastardly outrage. The British home fleet, Mediterranean fleet, and the port city of Gibraltar were told to prepare for war, and in London, satirical cards were being sold that read in disgraceful memory of the Russian Navy, the world's stumbling block to civilization, the 20th century savages who started on their road to destruction on October 23, 1904, in their brilliant naval battle when they completely routed nine disarmed fishing smacks in British waters. In his diary, Tsar Nicholas wrote that the British are very angry and near to boiling point. They are even said to be getting their fleet ready for action. Yesterday, I sent a telegram to Uncle Bertie, expressing my regret, but I did not apologize. I do not think the English will have the cheek to go further than to indulge in threats. The Russian 2nd Pacific Squadron had been at sea no more than a week, and it seemed they were about to bring Britain, Japan's ally, into the war. By the 26th, British cruisers were following the Russian fleet out of the English Channel, 
and a force of 28 battleships had been assembled. The Times wrote, The mind of the government, like the mind of the nation, is made up. Rozhetsvinsky and the Russian sailors were unaware of the diplomatic impact of their actions until arriving at Vigo Bay in northern Spain. Orders were given to begin recoaling. However, they were stopped by the local authorities. The Spanish government, under diplomatic pressure from the British, enforced the international law relating to combatant ships in neutral ports, and Spanish policemen proceeded to board the Russian warships. Eventually, the fleet was given permission to rest, but not refuel. After a brief rage, Rozhetsvinsky went to visit the port's commandant. The Spanish official was surprisingly understanding, and the ships were, in the end, allowed to take on 400 tons of coal. The Tsar also reaffirmed his confidence in the Admiral. While there may be temporary difficulties between Russia and a friendly nation, I have given my ministers orders to settle these differences as soon as possible. The eyes of Russia are on you, and our hope and confidence accompany you. On November 1st, British First Sea Lord Admiral Jackie Fisher wrote to his wife, It had been nearly war again, very near indeed, but the Russians have climbed down. Tempers cooled. Rozhetsvinsky apologized for the incident, and a number of eyewitnesses from the fleet were offloaded in Spain. They would later face an international tribunal in Paris. The fleet promised that they would act with more caution on the rest of their journey, and Russia was made to pay 65,000 pounds to the families of the fishermen, around 10 million present-day dollars. At 7 a.m., on November 1st, the Second Pacific Fleet left port from Vigo, Spain, and headed south to Morocco and the city of Tangier. The diplomatic fallout between Russia and Britain was still bitter, and the British Channel Fleet went on to shadow the Russians. A crewman on the Oral stated, It's disgusting to treat us like this, following us about like criminals. By November 3rd, the fleet had reassembled at Tangier, and the British had left. This allowed the Russians to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Tsar's ascension. More pressing than celebration, however, was, again, refueling. Every available man and officer was made to help in the back-breaking labor-intensive work of shifting hundreds of tons of coal from the port into the ships and colliers. In an effort to motivate his crews, Rozhetsvinsky offered 1,500 rubles to the crew that finished the fastest. Admiral Rozhetsvinsky would also make the decision to divide his fleet. It was considered an unnecessary risk to send the main battleships through the British-owned Suez Canal, now considered hostile waters. Instead, Admiral Felkerzam would take some of the older ships, the Sisoy Veliki, Navarin, Svetlana, Zimchug, Almaz, and some support ships through the Suez Canal, while Rozhetsvinsky and the main fleet would make the arduous journey around the southern tip of the African continent and the Cape of Good Hope. It was then planned for the two fleets to later rendezvous in French-controlled Madagascar. As Felkerzam headed to the Mediterranean and on to the Suez Canal, the 2nd Pacific Squadron set sail for Dakar, the capital of French West Africa and present-day Senegal. Arriving in Dakar by November 16th, the fleet met with 10 German colliers from the Hamburg American Line carrying 30,000 tons of coal. Addressing the constant headache of the supply of fuel, Rozhetsvinsky issued the Instructions for Storing Coal, 
His orders were that coal was to be stored not only in the ship's hulls, but in any spare place on the upper deck, lower deck, gun deck, poop deck, and in the cockpit, over closed watertight manhole covers, in the bathrooms, drying rooms, loose on the quarter deck, with some means of preventing it falling overboard. Officers' dorms, up to the rank of commander, were not exempt. The Subarov class ships, with a capacity of 1,100 tons, were ordered to take on board twice as much. The massive excess in weight left the warships, as described by a witness, like sluggish, overloaded river barges. On the west coast of Africa, temperatures could reach as high as 49 degrees, with over 90% humidity. As the routine drudgery of recoaling began anew, in the blaring heat, many of the crew members, particularly the stokers, close to the flames in the metal belly of the ships, died from heat exhaustion. Others died from heart attacks and the deadly dust invading their throats, noses, eyes, and lungs. There was also insufficient water to combat the onslaught of misery. Chief Engineer Politovsky wrote, We are tormented by thirst, hot and unpleasant, but one drinks incessantly. I alone drank six bottles of lemonade today. Our comings, our goings, our voyage, our success depend on coal. Coal dust has penetrated everywhere, into the cabins, the cupboards, onto the tables, the decks are clouded with dust. Everyone is so black that you do not recognize people at once. At one point, the French admiral stationed in Dakar informed Rozhetsvinsky that the coaling had to cease, to which Rozhetsvinsky shouted in response, I intend to take on coal unless your shore batteries prevent me. With no response from the shore batteries, after 29 hours, the process was completed. The next stop was Gabon. The fleet arrived at French-controlled Gabon on November 25th after initially sailing past the port by mistake. The authorities at the capital city, at Libreville, denied the Russians usage of the port. Instead, the recoaling would have to take place four miles offshore. During the two-day wait for the arrival of the colliers, the ship's crews were allowed to take leave onshore. After Gabon, the fleet headed towards Great Fish Bay in Portuguese Angola. Portugal was an ally of the British, and so telegrams were sent from Lisbon ordering that the Second Pacific Squadron be refused access to port. The Portuguese gunboat Limpopo took aim at the unarmed colliers that had arrived before the fleet, but was outgunned once the battleships arrived. The Portuguese captain ordered the Russian fleet to leave and threatened drastic action. Knowing that they would be gone by the time any serious reinforcements arrived, these threats were not taken seriously. Even still, the port was too small for the Russian fleet, and so coaling took place in nearby international waters. With the rolling and crashing of the tide, the business of coaling took much longer than usual as ships smashed up against one another. On board the Oriole, a young lieutenant, now two months at sea, appeared to reach the end of his tether. He began running around on deck as he sobbed and screamed, The Japs are waiting for us. We shall all be sunk. We shall all be sunk. The distressed lieutenant was locked in his cabin under guard, and the fleet pushed on to Angra Pequena in the more hospitable German Southwest Africa, present-day Namibia. The British had again attempted to pressure the port's authorities into refusing the Russians, but the German governor remained unmoved. 
with having to avoid British South Africa. This would be the last stop before the 3,000 mile journey to Madagascar and the rendezvous with Felkerzam. The fleet arrived in German Southwest Africa on December 11th, although a major storm in the region prevented the ships from recoaling until December 15th. The same day that the storm died down and the torture of shifting hundreds of tons of coal began again, the German governor came aboard the Suvorov to dine with Rojetsvinsky. The governor informed the admiral of two pieces of news. First, that there were rumors of fishing boats being fitted with torpedoes with the aim of sinking the Russian ships off the coast of Durban in South Africa, and that London had sent a telegram telling Rojetsvinsky to avoid a second Dogger Bank incident, to which the admiral responded, I will ruthlessly destroy all Durbanese fishing craft who attempt to break through my squadron or come within torpedo range. The second piece of news the German governor imparted to Rozhetsvinsky was of the fall of Hill 203, to which the admiral responded, Hill 203, and what is that? The governor then explained how the hill dominated the surrounding area and its fall likely signaled the fall of Port Arthur, which would make the relief of the port, a key objective of their mission, now pointless. Despite the ill tidings, the 2nd Pacific Squadron pushed on, leaving Angra Pequeña on December 17th as the fleet made its way around the Cape of Good Hope on the southern tip of Africa, they were hit by a hurricane. The fleet became dispersed. One boat lost contact, and another's engine failed. In the midst of the storm, the Kamchatka signaled Rozhetsvinsky, complaining about their quality of coal, and requested permission to throw about 150 tons overboard to which Rozhetsvinsky responded, Find the guilty ones and throw them overboard instead. A little later, the Kamchatka sent another message. Do you see the torpedo boats? Battle stations were manned and guns readied until a second response. Sorry, we are all right now. The ship had mistakenly used the wrong signal. The Russian fleet continued on without incident and managed to reach Madagascar by January 7th. Rozhetsvinsky then anchored at Ile Santa Marie, an island off the east coast of Madagascar. However, Falkerzam and the older ships that had passed through the Suez Canal had stationed themselves at Nasi Bay on the northern point of Madagascar, 500 miles away from Ile Santa Marie. Felkezam then wrote that he was overhauling his equipment and would be unable to sail for two weeks. Rozhetsvinsky responded enraged. If they are so old that they can't steam, then they may go to the devil. We have no use for rubbish here. I'll go there myself. I'll dig them out fast enough. The main fleet then set off for Nosi Bay. It was around this time that further ill tidings arrived from Manchuria, that the whole of the 1st Pacific Fleet had been interned or destroyed, and of the imminent capitulation of Port Arthur. The news dramatically lowered odds of Russian success and brought the whole reasoning behind the mission into question. In response, the Russian Naval High Command decided to double down their efforts and created a third Pacific fleet. The combined fleet would then be tasked with taking control of the Yellow Sea and the Sea of Japan in order to isolate the Japanese armies in the field. The third Pacific fleet was a grandiose name for what was in reality 
a collection of ships previously thought to be too old and ineffective for battle, and originally left behind by the 2nd Pacific Squadron. The 3rd Pacific Fleet included the battleship Nikolai I, the coastal defense ships Apraxin, Siniavin, and Ushakov, and the armored cruiser Monomak, which, back in 1891, was previously captained by Oskar Stark, the commander of the Russian 1st Pacific Fleet during the start of the war. There were also hopes that the Black Sea Fleet would provide substantial reinforcements. However, the Ottoman Empire was immovable in refusing to allow the ships to pass through the Dardanelles. The dead weight Third Fleet would require a further month of preparation for its journey, which left a restless Rojasvinsky and his crew stationed in Madagascar for the time being, as well as the Third Pacific Fleet. Further Russian reinforcements were already en route in the form of the Overtaking Division, two additional cruisers, the Oleg and Izumrud, and eight other ships. Rojasvinsky then received orders that he was to await the arrival of these additional cruisers. Wanting to press on with the mission at hand, the Admiral responded, Telegraph to St. Petersburg that I wish to be relieved of my command. He then isolated himself in his cabin for two days, and his resignation was later denied. Like the Admiral, the fleet was depressed and alone. On Christmas Day, Rozhetsvinsky managed to draw himself from his isolation, as one witness described, as if forcing himself out of a coma. He then stood on top of the 12-inch guns of the Suvorov and delivered onto the crew a rousing speech. May God help us to serve her, honorably, to justify her confidence, not to deceive her hopes, to you whom I trust. The speech had the desired effect, and it seemed for the moment morale was high and the sailors ready. Commander Vladimir Simonov wrote of the day, if only we could go into action now. But the battle to come was still some time away. And on January 10th, 1905, the main force of the 2nd Pacific Squadron rendezvoused with Felkerzam at Nossi Bay. On February 15th, the overtaking division arrived at Madagascar, and on February 16th, there was news that the 3rd Pacific Fleet, under the command of Admiral Nebogatov, was leaving port in the Baltic and the 2nd Pacific Fleet was expected to wait at Nossi Bay for the arrival of the 3rd. During the enforced idleness, the crews were allowed on shore leave, during which discipline and the effectiveness of the ships began to diminish through a series of unfortunate happenings. Historian Alastair Horn wrote of this time, Ships stank from rotten food, the cold storage supply ship Esperance had her refrigeration plant break down and in consequence was forced to throw overboard 700 tons of bad meat. The windfall lured in swarms of sharks from miles around. They made life impossibly dangerous for underwater crews sent down to attempt to clean the ship's keels fouled by weed and barnacles. Several lives were lost, and this essential work abandoned. A vital firing exercise, badly needed by the untrained gunners, was a disaster. Ships nearly collided, and the gunnery was wild. One of the battleship's munition hoists jammed. Inside it, a cobra nest was discovered, the snake coiled within. It appeared to have come aboard in a bale of hay for the livestock. Rojasvinsky suspended the exercise, remarking savagely, By day, the entire squadron did not score one single hit on targets, which represented the torpedo boats 
although these targets differed from the Japanese boats, to our advantage, and as much as they were stationary. The Russian sailor Alexei Novikov Priboy of the Orel noted, Our men despaired of escaping from the war with their lives, so they drowned their thought and drink, dicing, and prostitution. News began to arrive of the events of Bloody Sunday, and rumors were circulating that the putrid meat being served to the crews was coming from diseased cows. In response, the crews of several ships mutinied. However, these insurrections were quickly crushed. From the Nakamov, 14 arbitrarily chosen ringleaders were shot, and members of the Borodino, Alexander III, and Kamchatka were court-martialed. An old ship, the Melee, was sent back to Russia, filled with those who had mutinied, as well as the sick suffering from malaria, dysentery, and typhoid, and those who had mentally broken down. On March 15th, news arrived that the 3rd Pacific Squadron was coaling off the island of Crete in the Mediterranean. Roja Tsvinsky had been under direct orders to await the arrival of the overtaking division. However, to wait for the 3rd Squadron was only implied, seeing his fleet degenerate in the stagnation, and, upon hearing of defeat at the Battle of Mukden, the Admiral made the decision to forego Admiral Nabogatov and the 3rd Fleet and press on to the Pacific. On March 17, 1905, the Second Pacific Squadron, formerly the Baltic Fleet, departed Madagascar and set forth across the Indian Ocean. After leaving Nossi Bay, the whereabouts of the fleet was unknown to anyone outside of it, including those in command in St. Petersburg. Fueled by previously attained stockpiles of food and coal, the ships steamed through the Indian Ocean with only themselves as company, lost to the world for over 3,000 miles. It wasn't until three weeks later that the 2nd Pacific Squadron was sighted again. A number of sailors had taken their own lives during the voyage, and... The torture of recoaling was endured again and again, but on April 8th, the fleet passed the British-held port city of Singapore. The sight of almost 50 ships of the Russian Navy having sailed halfway across the world was described by the Times as a splendid spectacle, and Reuters noted the smoke they made was visible for miles. The ships, magnificent but foul, were proceeding at about eight knots, and it took them 55 minutes to pass a given point. All the vessels showed signs of their long voyage in tropical seas, about a foot of seaweed being visible along the waterline, and the decks were laden with coal. The crews had become so competent at recoaling that the Suvorov was able to take on board up to 120 tons in an hour. It was in Singapore that Rozhetsvinsky was able to make contact with the Russian consul and St. Petersburg. They confirmed earlier reports from Manchuria. Mukden has fallen, General Kuropotkin dismissed and gave definitive orders to wait for the arrival of Admiral Nebogatov and the 3rd Squadron, who were currently in Djibouti on the Horn of Africa. Rozhetsvinsky was also given new orders to sail the fleet to Vladivostok and hand over command to Admiral Alexei Birilev. To be told to hand over command of the fleet he had taken halfway around the world no doubt dampened Rozhetsvinsky's spirits.
After the quick transfer of updates, the fleet set off from Singapore, as it was assumed the British, not best pleased since Dogger Bank, would be informing their Japanese allies of the location of the Russian ships. There were brief discussions on sailing straight for Vladivostok. However, the Alexander III, an essential battleship, had underloaded on coal by 400 tons. As a result, the fleet headed for Kamran Bay in French Indochina, present-day Vietnam. It would be there that the Second Pacific Fleet would await the arrival of the Third. The Russian fleet arrived in Kamran Bay on the morning of April 14, 1905. On that same day, Japanese Admiral Arisugawa was making his way south towards Singapore on board a neutral German steamer. The ship passed the Russian fleet, and Arisugawa immediately sent a dispatch to Tokyo informing them of the Russian fleet's location. The Japanese government then filed complaints against the French government, stating that they, a neutral party, were harboring ships at war. As a result, shore leave was refused to the crew, and discontent continued to grow as they waited for the Third Pacific Fleet. Suicides continued at a steady pace, a number of sailors deserted, the crews still remained without letters from home, and a mutiny was crushed on the oral. By April 18th, coaling was completed, but the Second Pacific Fleet continued to wait for the arrival of Nabogatov and the Third. However, Nabogatov had no idea where Rojasvinsky was. From Madagascar to Singapore, the fleet's movements were unknown to the world. This issue was resolved by a Russian quartermaster named Babushkin. Babushkin had been wounded during the siege of Port Arthur and was being sent home through Singapore. When he had heard that the Second Pacific Fleet had recently made its way through Singapore, and that the Third Pacific Fleet had yet to arrive, Babushkin took it upon himself to take a boat out into the open sea and to wait for Nebogatov. Defying the odds, Babushkin was able to make contact with the Third Fleet and direct them on to French Indochina. Admiral Nabogatov and the 3rd Pacific Fleet arrived in Kamran Bay on the 9th of May. Nikolai Ivanovich Nabogatov was born in 1849, the son of an officer near St. Petersburg. Nabogatov became a naval cadet at 16 and joined the Navy soon after. His initial progress was slow, and he wasn't given command until 1889, with the gunboat Grad. He became a captain in 1894, a rear admiral in 1901, and at the start of the war was stationed with a practice artillery unit in the Black Sea Fleet. In December 1904, he was given command of the newly formed 3rd Pacific Fleet. Historian Alastair Horn described how Nabogatov would move about his deck in little steps. He was an unimpressive figure, but quietly spoken, mild-mannered, approachable, and tolerant of his crews to an extent incomprehensible to the fiery Rojatsvinsky. Rojatsvinsky had always been against the idea of a third fleet, and thought the obsolete ships would only hinder the main force. The Admiral's disdain for the old vessels translated to disdain for Admiral Nabogatov himself. When the 3rd Pacific Fleet rendezvoused with the 2nd, Nabogatov was greeted with icy formality. After sailing from the Baltic to Indochina, Admiral Nabogatov was granted a 30-minute meeting with Admiral Rojatsvinsky, during which 
there was no talk of tactics or strategy, only that he was to paint his ship's funnels yellow and to start coaling immediately. Nabogotov would later recall, we never discussed a plan of campaign. Behind the cold exterior, Rozhetsvinsky was worried. His fears revolved around his second-in-command, Admiral Felkerzam. Felkerzam had taken the 2nd Pacific Fleet's original older ships through the Suez Canal and had regrouped with Rozhetsvinsky at Madagascar. However, Felkerzam had cancer, and during the wait at Kamran Bay, he suffered a stroke. The stroke was subsequently hidden from the men. If Felkerzam were to die, it would place Nebogatov second in command, and if Rozhetsvinsky were to become incapacitated, Nebogatov would become commander of the entire Russian 2nd Pacific Fleet, an outcome Rozhetsvinsky wished to avoid. Despite the intrigue in the upper ranks, the arrival of the 3rd Pacific Squadron helped increase the morale of the sailors, and on May 14, 1905, the 52 ships of the Russian Navy stationed in Indochina left port and headed north. Historian D.W. Mitchell described the Baltic fleet's journey to Asia as unquestionably one of the greatest logistic feats in the history of warfare. Before leaving, Rozhetsvinsky sent a final message to St. Petersburg. I will not telegraph you again before the battle. If I am beaten, Togo will tell you. If I beat him, I will let you know. While the Russian 2nd Pacific Fleet was undertaking its odyssey, by January 1905, the Japanese Combined Fleet, in concert with the Army, had sunk the remnants of the Russian 1st Pacific Fleet. On February 26, the International Tribunal, which had investigated the Dogger Bank incident, published its findings. The report informed the Japanese that Russia was sending four battleships to the theater. The Suvorov, Alexander III, Borodino, and Orel. The amount matched the Japanese battleships, the Mikasa, Shikishima, Fuji, and Asahi. Further intelligence was leaked on May 14th, when the British Daily Telegraph published that the Russians were leaving Kamran Bay. It had been over a year since the Japanese surprise attack on Port Arthur, on February 8, 1904. From the start, Admiral Togo had been cautious with his battleships, and had failed to destroy the Russian fleet in port. With a Japanese victory at Mukden, pressure for peace from outside powers and a nation and economy strained by war, it seemed a decisive conclusion was necessary. Togo's initial caution was abandoned as he told his crew on May 15th, If your sword is too short, take one step forward. There is no need to think of defense. After leaving Indochina, the 2nd Pacific Squadron was faced with a decision as to which route they would take to Vladivostok. There were two options, and each option presented a further two options. First was whether to travel east or west of the Japanese home islands. To go east was the longer of the two and would require further coaling. Going east would also require the fleet to pass through either the Sugaru Strait between Honshu, the central home island, and Hokkaido, the northernmost home island, or the La Perouse Strait between Hokkaido and Sakhalin Island. Reports from Russian agents described the Sugaru route as being heavily mined as well as the presence of torpedo boats. Commander Vladimir Simonov described it as a torturous channel and that the Sugaru Strait could not be considered at all. 
The La Perouse Strait was notoriously difficult to navigate, and given the size of the fleet and the possibility of a turn in the weather, the route was discarded. With going east now out of the question, this left the west, through the Sea of Japan in between Korea and Japan. The fleet would have to pass through either the Korean Straits or the Tsushima Straits, each either side of the island of Tsushima. The Korean Straits were denied, given their narrow size and the knowledge of Japanese naval bases on the southern tip of Korea. And so, it was decided that the Russian fleet would head west of Japan and through the Tsushima Straits. On May 25, 1905, six Russian colliers were sighted in Shanghai by the Japanese. This confirmed that the Russians would be taking the shorter western route, which was the better outcome for Togo, as he had stationed the entire combined fleet in the Korean port of Maesan, near Busan, on the edge of the Korean Straits, which had been considered a gamble by some. During the time waiting for the arrival of the Russian squadron, the Japanese Navy had went about mapping the entire Korean Straits and Sea of Japan, dividing it into squares representing 10 minutes travel length by width. The squares were then numbered, allowing for easier directives in the coming battle. In preparation for a possible breakthrough, the seas around Vladivostok were also mined. As the Russian fleet approached the Tsushima Straits, Admiral Togo sent orders on May 26th. Prepare for action. Tomorrow, at the hoisting of the colors, battle flags are to be sent up. That same night, Admiral Rozhetsvinsky spoke to his men. I pray that God may strengthen my right hand and that if I fail to fulfill the oath I have sworn, he may purge my country from shame with my blood. While approaching the Straits of Tsushima, Admiral Rozhetsvinsky reorganized his fleet into three divisions. The first division consisted of four battleships, Rozhetsvinsky's flagship, the Suvorov, Alexander III, Borodino, and Orel. The second division was made up of the smaller battleships, the Osliabia, Navarin, Sisoy Veliki, and the armored cruiser Nakimov. The third division was made up of the older battleships, the Nikolai I, Apraksin, Sinyavin, and Ushakov. The cruisers Zimchug and Izumrud formed the attached cruisers group, and the first cruiser division was made up of the Oleg, Aurora, Dmitry Donskoy, and Monomak. The unarmored cruiser Svetlana and the armed merchant cruiser Ural made up a scouting division, and nine destroyers made up the destroyer flotilla. There were also nine auxiliary ships, including the repair ship Kamchatka and the hospital ship Oryol. Admiral Rozhetsvinsky would command the 1st Division. Admiral Feltkerzam, now incapacitated following his stroke, would in theory command the 2nd Division. Admiral Nabogatov would command the 3rd Division, and Admiral Inquist, commanded the 1st Cruiser Division. Rozhetsvinsky further reorganized the fleet into two columns. In the starboard column on the right were the 1st and 2nd Divisions. The 3rd Division made up the port side column on the left. Admiral Togo would command the Japanese fleet during the upcoming battle. However, his strategy was largely derived from Commander Sanayuki Akiyama. Commander Akiyama was a member of the operations and planning staff for the combined fleet 
and a close confidant of Admiral Togo. He was referred to as the single brain of the Japanese Navy by Japanese Admiral Hasegawa. Born in 1868, he served as a navigation officer in the 1894-95 First Sino-Japanese War, and later in the intelligence section. He was promoted to lieutenant in 1896 and went to study in America, where he was a naval observer during the Spanish-American War. After further study in America and Britain, he returned to Japan in 1900, where he served on the Navy's general staff, fleet staff, and at the Naval War College. At the outbreak of war, he served as a staff officer on the Mikasa. For the Battle of Tsushima, he designed a seven-stage plan of action, which, for the most part, Togo sought to follow. Akiyama was a gifted strategist, but seen as an eccentric by his peers. Admiral Hasegawa further recalled how Togo was a strict disciplinarian, however, Akiyama behaved as he wished, often appearing in the Admiral's presence wearing a shoe on one foot and a slipper on the other. Sometimes his buttons were all set in the wrong holes. He was absent-minded about everything but his job. I have seen him drink beer with flies in his glass. The Russian sailors remained manned at their stations for days, and radio silence was maintained as the fleet passed through a deep-set fog. On May 26th, the Russian crews had a short celebration for the anniversary of the Tsar's coronation. Vodka was given to the men, champagne and rum to the officers. Similarly, in preparation for the coming battle, rum was issued to the Japanese sailors and cigars from the emperor given to the officers. The night of the 26th saw Admiral Felkerzam succumb to his stroke and die. Rozhetsvinsky still wished to prevent Nebogatov's ascension and was worried about the effect of the death on the morale of the fleet. With these two considerations, he decided not to inform the men, and command of the 2nd Division was given to Captain Vladimir Bear of the Osliaba. Nebogatov was unaware that he was now de facto second in command, and the sailors of the 2nd Division were unaware that they were headed into battle under a dead admiral. On the Russian ships, holy water blessed the guns, while combustibles and excess weight, except a portion of coal for the journey to Vladivostok, were thrown overboard, although flammable coal dust still covered the ships. While a priest conducted mass on board the Oral, Alexei Novikov Priboy observed that the men's faces were sour and rigid. They crossed themselves as if flapping away flies. Captain Clapier de Cologne of the Suvorov wrote that during the night before, Hardly anyone slept. It was clear we'd be meeting the enemy in full strength. For the Japanese combined fleet, the first division was made up of four battleships. Togo's flagship, the Mikasa, the Shikishima, Fuji, and Asahi, as well as the armored cruisers, Kasuga and Nishin. The second division consisted of the armored cruisers Izumo, Azuma, Tokiwa, Yakumo, Asama, and Iwate. The third division included the cruisers Kasagi, Chitosa, Nitaka, and Otawa. The fourth, fifth, and sixth divisions had a further 11 unarmored cruisers, including the Naniwa, Akashi, and Matsushima, as well as the ironclad Chinen. The Japanese combined fleet also included 20 destroyers, 16 torpedo boats, and three dispatch boats. Admiral Togo would command the 1st Division, Admiral Kamimura led the 2nd Division, and Admiral Kataoka 
commanded the 3rd Division. The Russian fleet was making its way through the narrow 30-mile Tsushima Straits. At 2.45 a.m. on May 27, 1905, the Japanese auxiliary cruiser Shinamo Maru spotted lights coming through the thick mist. The lights belonged to the Russian hospital ship Oriol. The Oriol mistakenly took the Shinano Maru for a Russian vessel and notified the Japanese crew that they should be careful given that there are other Russian ships nearby. Eventually, the Shinano Maru's captain, Narukawa Hakura, saw ten of these other ships and at 4.55 a.m. signaled Admiral Togo. The enemy sighted in number 203 section. He seems to be steering for the Eastern Channel. Referencing the Japanese mapping system of the entire Korean Straits and Sea of Japan, which divided the area into squares, the Russian fleet being first sighted in square 203 was a coincidence, or omen, given that the hill which had brought Japanese victory at Port Arthur included the same number, Hill 203. And, with the use of radio and telegraphs on board both fleets, the Battle of Tsushima would be the first electronic naval battle in history. Togo wrote that the news of the Russian sighting was received with enthusiastic joy by the whole fleet. At 5.05 a.m., Admiral Togo ordered the Japanese combined fleet, stationed in the Korean port of Masan, to prepare to embark for the Tsushima Straits. All coal was ordered to be thrown overboard to ensure maximum maneuverability. Given that the Russians were keeping a portion of their own coal, coupled with the extensive weeds and sea growth accumulated over half a year at sea, the Japanese would have at least a knot advantage in speed. At 6.34 a.m., Togo sent a final message to the Navy minister in Tokyo. The enemy fleet has been sighted. Our fleet will proceed forthwith to sea to attack the enemy and destroy him. Today's weather is fine, but waves are high. At 7 a.m., Japanese cruisers began shadowing the Russian fleet, but accurate observation was difficult in the fog. The first cruiser to appear was the Izumo, later joined by a further three cruisers and the Chinen. Togo wished to engage the Russians only after they had passed through the narrow straits, which would grant space for maneuvers. With the sight of the Japanese ships, Rojatsvinsky ordered the fleet into battle formation, merging the two columns into a single battle line with the 1st Division leading, followed by the 2nd, then 3rd. A further four Japanese cruisers arrived. However, they were still only observing the Russian fleet and did not engage. Despite being in range of the 12-inch guns of the Suvorov, Rojatsvinsky chose not to fire at the Japanese ships. Eventually, the tension was broken, and at 11.45 a.m., when Captain Young of the Oral took the initiative and began firing at the Izumo, an action which was copied throughout the fleet. The Japanese began to move out of range, and Rojatsvinsky ordered the ships to cease fire in order to conserve ammunition for the fighting to come. At around 12 p.m., Rojatsvinsky, anticipating a Japanese attack from the east, ordered the 1st and 2nd Divisions to break away from the single-line formation to increase speed and turn 90 degrees starboard to the right. Just as the majority of the 1st Division had completed the maneuver, Japanese cruisers reappeared, the Alexander III had also mistakenly turned left instead of right, which added to the fleet's confusion.
Rozhetsvinsky then canceled the order and ordered the second division, led by the Osilabia, to maintain their course. The admiral then repositioned the first division back 90 degrees port side. The second and third divisions now made a single column, with the first division sailing parallel, although slightly ahead. By 1.20 p.m., the mist had lifted and the Japanese and Russian fleets were now only seven miles apart. Twenty minutes later, the main fleets sighted one another. The two fleets were on a parallel course, the Russians moving northeast at 11 knots, the Japanese southwest at 14. The Japanese fleet arrived in a single battle line divided in two, the first division in front and the second division behind. Both admirals aimed to cross the T of the opposing fleet. To cross the T was a naval tactic wherein a line of battleships would pass from left to right or right to left ahead of a single line of enemy ships mimicking the shape of a capital T. This maneuver allows the upper line moving from side to side to fire all available guns from their broadside, the side of the ship, whereas the line moving down to up or up to down can only fire their forward-facing guns. This maximizes the attacker's firepower while minimizing the defender's. Rozhetsvinsky believed he could achieve this by moving either port or starboard, to the left or right. Togo thought it was possible by using his speed to overtake the incoming Russians. The Japanese fleet steamed ahead, and Togo managed to position his ships in a T formation ahead of the Russian fleet. However, the move was far too early, and the Russian fleet was still out of range of the Japanese guns. At 1.55 p.m., Togo raised his battle flag and issued the following message to the combined fleet. The Empire's fate depends on the result of this battle. Let every man do his utmost duty. Togo then aimed to cross the T again while closing the distance between the two fleets. He, in effect, ordered the single battle line to perform a U-turn on the Russian weaker left flank, headed by the Osilabia. While the Japanese were performing the turn, the Russian ships would continue to steam ahead and close the distance. At 2.05 p.m., the Japanese fleet was ordered to turn in sequence. The ships would turn 180 degrees, one after another, on the same position. This meant, for at least 10 minutes, every Japanese ship would pass through one point on the battlefield, making the task of the Russian gunners much easier. The maneuver was high risk, but, if completed, would allow Togo to cross the T again, this time in range. With the oncoming Japanese ships, Rozhetsvinsky ordered the single battle line to be reformed and for the first division to again head to the front. However, there was a failure to inform the battleships of the first division to increase their speed, whilst at the same time, the second and third divisions were not told to decrease their speed. The ships of the 1st Division clumsily forced themselves into position while the ensuing dislocation spread chaos throughout the whole line. Admiral Nabogatov described the scene. One vessel had to turn to starboard and another to port, so that there was absolute confusion. Mob is the only word literally to express our formation at this time. The Japanese began to turn in sequence. The flagship Mikasa led the van and took the brunt of the Russian response. 
At the long range of 9,000 yards, Russian fire from the Suvorov, Alexander III, and Borodino was accurate. Within 15 minutes, the Mikasa was hit 15 times by 6-inch and heavy 12-inch shells. Admiral Togo was wounded by a splinter in his thigh, and when asked to leave deck, responded, I'm getting on for 60. This old body of mine is no longer worth caring for. Upon seeing the Japanese turn, a Russian officer thought, How rash! Why, in a minute, we will be able to roll up their leading ships. Out of fear of hitting his own ships, Togo ordered the Japanese fleet not to respond to Russian fire. Instead, each ship ran the gauntlet of passing through the hail of Russian shells, which, at first, focused on the Mikasa, and then the axis of the turn. As the distance shortened from 9,000 to 7,000 yards, ammunition on board the Mikasa was detonated, and a 12-inch gun was put out of action. The battleship Shikishima also sustained significant hits. Once the Fuji and Asahi completed the turn, Togo ordered the fleet to begin firing, focusing on the leading Russian flagships, the Suvorov and Osliyaba. However, these initial Japanese shells failed to find their targets. After 20 minutes, the turn was completed. Every Japanese ship took damage, but survived. Rozhetsvinsky had allowed an extremely dangerous move on Togo's part to go largely unpunished. The official British observer, Captain Pakenham, was on board the Japanese Asahi. Supposedly, he sat on a deck chair, described by a witness as though he were aboard a committee boat keeping score at a yacht race. When the Asahi was hit, Pakenham recalled that he was struck by the right half of a man's lower jaw with teeth missing. Splashed with blood, he went below deck, returning in a fresh white uniform. The Russian 3rd Division focused fire on the armored cruisers of the Japanese 2nd Division and achieved some success. The Yakumo, Nishin, and Asama were hit and the Asama was forced to withdraw from the battle line. Eventually, however, the fighting moved out of Nebogatov's range. The newly turned Japanese battle line was moving at the high speed of 15 knots, and at this point was heading northwest, parallel to the Russian line. All 500 guns of the fleet fired upon the Suvorov and Osliyabya, this time with increased success as the distance closed to 5,000 yards. On board the Suvorov, which was taking the brunt of Japanese shells, Commander Semenov recalled, I had not only never witnessed such a fire before, but I had never imagined anything like it. Shells seemed to be pouring upon us incessantly, one after another, and that I was slipping and sliding in pools of new blood. At the height of the barrage, the Japanese fleet was firing as many as 2,000 shells per minute. Russian sailors were distressed at the amount of their misses and shells which failed to do damage, whilst Japanese accuracy continued to increase while the fighting went on. Free of excess coal, the wear and tear of a long voyage, and unburdened by older ships, the Japanese fleet was faster. The Japanese ships also employed Krupp armor plating and were equipped with 1903 model rangefinders. The Russian ships, on the other hand, used rangefinders from the 1880s. The disparity in experience also likely played a role. The Japanese fleet, having been at war in the Sea of Japan 
for over a year, the Russian fleet being largely made up of conscripts who had been force-marched halfway around the world. Further still, the Japanese shells contained Shimosa powder, developed by Japanese chemist Masachika Shimosa. The modified gunpowder resulted in more heat and larger blasts from the explosions. Going even further to maximize damage, the bursting charges in many of the shells were increased in size, making them far more likely to detonate. Commander Semenov wrote, It seemed as if these were mines, not shells, which were striking the ship's side and falling on deck. They burst as soon as they touched anything, the moment they encountered the least impediment in their flight. The flammable coal dust smothering the Russian ships, too, would have added fuel to the fires. In contrast, as many as one-third of Russian shells failed to explode on impact. Shells were falling relentlessly onto and around Rozhetsvinsky and the Suvorov. At one point, a shell landed in the officers' quarters and started a fire, which then began to spread throughout the ship. Simonov wrote of the scenes unfolding on board the Russian flagship as he attempted to galvanize the troops to fight the flames. The officer commanding the fire parties had had both his legs blown off and was carried below. Over and over again the hoses in use were changed for new ones, but these also were soon torn to ribbons, and the supply became exhausted. Without hoses, how could we pump water onto the bridges and spar deck where the flames raged? At times, it was impossible to see anything with glasses, owing to everything being so distorted with the quivering, heated air. Iron ladders were crumpled up into rings, and guns were literally hurled from their mountings. What havoc! Burning bridges, smoldering debris on the decks, piles of dead bodies, signaling and judging distance stations, guns directing positions, all were destroyed. And astern of us, Alexander and Borodino were also enveloped in smoke. When a heavy shell landed in the ship's hospital, Semenov wrote, Between the wrecked tables, stools, broken bottles, and different hospital appliances were some dead bodies, and a mass of something which, with difficulty, I guessed to be the remains of what had once been men. Despite the terror unfolding around them, the Russian gunners continued firing in response. As the distance between the ships became ever closer, at 2.20 p.m., Togo decided to change to armor-piercing shells which significantly increased the damage taken by the Russian battleships. Spare coal on board the Suvorov ignited, and the fire on board the ship raged from end to end. Rozhetsvinsky and his staff were positioned above the flames in the armored conning tower, the raised platform wherefrom the ship was directed, while dense, dark smoke engulfed the vessel. By 2.30 p.m., one of the Suvorov's funnels had been damaged beyond use, and so too had the main mast. This prevented the ship communicating with the rest of the fleet. At around 2.35 p.m., a Japanese armor-piercing shell hit the conning tower where Rozhetsvinsky was stationed. The shell failed to fully penetrate the armor, however shrapnel did manage to find its way inside. The metal tore through the room, killing most and wounding Rozhetsvinsky. Then the Suvorov was hit again, and the ship's steering mechanism was damaged. At 2.40 p.m., the ship turned to starboard and began moving away from the fighting. 
One Japanese witness described the state of the Suvorov as so battered that scarcely anyone would have taken her for a ship, and yet, even in this pitiful condition, like the flagship she was, she never ceased to fire as much as possible. Her upper part was riddled with holes, and she was entirely enveloped in smoke. Her masts had fallen and her funnels came down one after the other. She was unable to steer, and her fires increased in density every moment. The Suvorov was not the only Russian ship feeling the effects of the Japanese fire. The Osliabya, the flagship of the second division, was being ravaged by the guns of the Japanese cruisers. The Osliabya's hull had been hit a number of times, and a surviving officer recalled the damage. Three shells, one after the other, almost in the same identical spot. Imagine it, all of them in the same place, all on the waterline under the forward turret. Not a hole, but a regular gateway. The massive hole on the Osilabia's waterline caused water to surge in and begin flooding the ship. The surgeons in the bowels of the ship worked as water rose from the floor, and coal stokers were sealed inside with the engine rooms. The ship fell out of the battle line and began to roll over port side. At around 2.45 p.m., Captain Bear gave the order to abandon ship. Admiral Kamimura on board the Izumo wrote of the Osilabia, The whole of the starboard side as far as the keel was laid bare. Her bright plating looked like the wet scales of some sea monster, and suddenly, as if by command, all the men who had crowded to the starboard side jumped down upon those scales. Most of them were dashed against the keel and fell crippled into the sea. In the water, they formed unimaginable mass, and the enemy's shell never ceased the whole time from bursting over them. A few more seconds, and the Osilabia disappeared beneath the water. Captain Bear would go down with his ship and drown at sea. 470 of the ship's 770 strong crew shared a similar fate. The British onlooker Pakenham described the event as a terrible spectacle. Back on the limping Suvorov, Rozhetsvinsky had again sustained wounds, most seriously a shell splinter hitting his head, the impact of which then caused part of his skull to lodge itself inside his brain. Captain Clapier de Cologne, the Admiral's Chief of Staff, then decided to move the command center from the conning tower to one of the turrets. He led Rozhetsvinsky and a few survivors through the flame and debris until, during their journey, a shell fell amongst them. Rozhetsvinsky was wounded again, this time paralyzing his left leg. The admiral was carried into the turret and seated on a box. His staff were unaware of the severity of his injuries, and when asked about his condition, de Cologne remembered. He angrily replied it was only a trifle. Rozhetsvinsky then turned to his chief of staff and asked why the turret was not firing. De Cologne responded, Sir, they're all being killed. They're on fire. To which the heavily wounded admiral answered, Wait, aren't we all being killed also? While the Suvorov drifted eastwards, the Alexander III took position at the head of the line. Captain Bukvostov of the Alexander III decided to push forward and charge the Japanese fleet in a bid to divert their attention away from the Suvorov and the rest of the fleet. The diversion was successful, and while the Japanese guns were trained on the Alexander III, 
it too became a devastated wreck. The Alexander III was set aflame and moved out of the battle line and was replaced at the front by the Borodino. At the same time, a fire also broke out on board the Oral. With Rojatsvinsky incapacitated and Felkerzam dead before the battle, the command of the Russian fleet fell to Nabogatov. However, Nabogatov was not informed of the developments, and, for the time being, the Russian fleet fought without a commander. Order amongst the ships broke down, and the fighting was described by one observer as a battle of shadows. Togo's attention was again fixed on the Suvorov. Peckenham described the Russian flagship. Her condition seemed infinitely deplorable. Smoke curling round the stern was rolling horizontally away on the wind. Only a few sailors remained alive of the once 900-strong crew. As the Mikasa closed in, and began to open fire at 1,000 yards. By this time, the Mikasa had been hit 29 times, yet Togo was adamant upon sinking the Suvorov. Japanese reports soon came in that the enemy apparently altered course and disappeared in the fog. As a result, the Mikasa turned northwards to pursue the other Russian ships, whilst a number of Japanese cruisers and destroyers moved in to finish the Suvorov. The Russian destroyer Buony dodged its way through the enclosing Japanese ships and brought itself alongside the burning Suvorov. At this point, De Cologne implored Rozhetsvinsky, now barely conscious, to abandon ship. Come on, sir. We haven't much time. There are some cruisers coming up. Rozhetsvinsky then gave an order. Command to Nabogatov, Vladivostok. Course, north, 23 degrees east. With the admiral in a life-threatening condition, his skull still piercing his brain, as the ships rolled in the water, Rozhetsvinsky was carried with great care from the flagship Suvorov onto the destroyer Buony. On board the Buony were some 200 survivors of the Osilabia and a few from the Suvorov, including Semenov. A number of sailors remained on the Suvorov to ensure its guns kept firing until the last possible moment. Japanese Admiral Kataoka, who was commanding the encircling cruisers and destroyers, who would seal the Suvorov's fate, recalled, She scarcely looked like a man of war at all. Her interior was ablaze, and the holes in her side and gun ports shot out tongues of flame. Thick volumes of black smoke rolled low on her deck, and her whole appearance was indescribably pathetic. She turned to starboard and port, as if seeking to escape, while the two or three stern guns, which were all that remained to her, kept up a heroic defense. Seven torpedoes were then fired. Three detonated. One hit the flagship's ammunition. There was an explosion, and engineers were scalded to death as superheated steam burst from exploding pipes and others drowned from the rising water as a thick cloud of yellow smoke engulfed the Suvorov. Kataoka continues. For a short time she floated upwards and then at 7.30 lifted her brow high in the air and slid rapidly out of sight. Of the original 900 crew, there were only 20 survivors. At a range of 5,000 yards, the Japanese battle line concentrated its fire on the Borodino and Alexander III. While the Suvorov was being encircled, 
The Alexander III was hit multiple times and abruptly keeled over, sinking within minutes. Of her 836-man crew, there were no survivors. The Kamchatka also went under, filling, as a witness recalled, the sea thick with drowning sailors. As the sun began to set, Togo ordered his ships to cease fire and regroup. However, Captain Matsumoto Kazu, commanding the battleship Fuji, had already loaded his 12-inch guns and decided to empty them into the Borodino before regrouping. The Fuji's last act of the day hit the Borodino under a 6-inch gun and resulted in its magazines detonating with a colossal explosion. Pakenham described the event as The sensation of the day, an immense column of smoke ruddied on its underside by the glare of the explosion and, from the fire abaft, spurted to the height of her funnel tops. A dense cloud brooded over the place she had occupied. Of the Borodino's 854 crewmen, one survived. An officer on board the Oleg stated that The loss of the Borodino, which happened before our eyes, was so unexpected that we were stupefied, and, uncovering our heads, we gazed on the foaming grave of this heroic ship. The Borodino swiftly went under. It was the third Russian battleship to do so that afternoon. Three of the four battleships which had made up the first division were no more, and the Russian Second Pacific Fleet ceased to exist as a fighting unit. As darkness fell, the Japanese fleet regrouped to protect against Russian torpedo boats, while at the same time Japanese torpedo boats were set onto the remnants of the Russian fleet to ensure maximum damage. The Japanese torpedo boats were ordered to engage at the extremely close distance of at least 600 yards. The torpedo boat captains were also ordered to ram the Russian ships should they be unable to fire. A Japanese officer on board one of the torpedo boats wrote to a friend, we ought to be able to close within 20 yards of the targets before she is sunk. If we hit, we shall go down with the Russians. If we are hit, the Russians shall come with us, for the last man alive will steer the spare torpedo in the water. What is life but a summer night's dream? Admiral Enquist, commanding the 1st Cruiser Division, fled from the scene. He broke contact with the fleet and with the Aurora, Zimchug, and Oleg headed towards American Manila. In the Philippines, the battered ships and sailors would be interned as combatants in a neutral port. However, despite the damage, many of the crew were still breathing. During the escape, the Dmitry Donskoy had lagged behind and was left. It was then sunk by the Japanese, killing or wounding the entire crew, as well as 270 survivors from the Osilabia and Buini. Before it sank below the waves, the crew of the Dmitry Donskoy fought to the last and managed to sink two Japanese destroyers as well as damage four cruisers and another destroyer. At around 21.30, the cruiser Nakamov was hit by a torpedo and began to sink. The ship was later abandoned near Tsushima Island and scuttled by the crew the following morning. 25 of the Nakamov's crew had died, 51 had been injured, 523 were captured by the Japanese cruiser Sado Maru, 103 attempted to escape by boat but were later captured, and 18 went missing. At 2 a.m., the Navarin 
having survived flooding earlier in the battle, struck mines and sunk, killing 671 of the crew and leaving three survivors. The Sisoy Veliki, which had survived the day's artillery duel with the crew, successfully battling fires and flooding, was hit by a Japanese torpedo. The rudder was severely damaged and the ship was unable to steer. The crew were then forced to surrender to a Japanese armed merchant ship. The Sisoy Veliki was abandoned and sank at 10.05 a.m. on May 28th. Fifty of the crew had been killed. By morning of the 28th, Admiral Nabogatov commanded over what remained of the Russian 2nd Pacific Squadron. The 1st Division's Oral. Nabogatov's flagship, the 3rd Division's Nikolai I, the Apraxin, and Senyavin, as well as the attached cruiser division's Izumrud. The Ushakov, however, had become lost during the night's fighting. With a number of smaller ships, Nabogatov headed for Vladivostok at the crawling pace of nine knots. By 9 a.m., they were surrounded by the 27 ships of the still intact Japanese combined fleet. Nabogatov recalled, It was clear they were making a ring around us with a well-defined radius. Togo ordered his crews to begin shelling Nabogatov and his remaining vessels, making sure to stay at a safe distance to prevent any further damage. With only one of the Oral's damaged guns being able to respond from a distance. Nabogatov then discussed what was to be done with his officers. Finally, at 10.34 a.m. on May 28, 1905, Admiral Nikolai Nabogatov surrendered the Russian 2nd Pacific Squadron, declaring to his men, You are young, and it is you who will one day retrieve the honor and glory of the Russian Navy. The lives of the 2,400 men in these ships are more important than mine. Which he said, under the presumption, he would be executed upon his return to Russia. The XGE flag, the international signal for surrender, was then hoisted. Captain Fairson of the cruiser Izumrud disobeyed the order to surrender and, at a pace of 24 knots, steamed ahead and attempted to break out the Japanese encirclement. Togo did not accept the surrender and continued firing. When a Japanese officer drew the Admiral's attention to the request for surrender, Togo replied, I will not cease fire until they stop their engines. Eventually, the Russian ships except the Izumrud, complied and stopped their engines. Togo later recalled his reaction to the surrender. It really was the strangest occurrence, and we were astonished and somewhat disappointed. The Japanese guns were then silenced, and in an act of respect, Nabogatov and his officers were allowed to keep their swords. The Russian ships were then escorted into Japanese ports. As the Russian crews lined the decks, they were described by witnesses as herds of tiny gray sheep calmly awaiting their fate. The Izumrud had managed to escape the Japanese encirclement. However, it lacked the fuel necessary for the journey to Vladivostok, and the ship was then run aground somewhere in Siberia. The Russian battleship Yushakov had been separated from the fleet during the night. The crew were unaware of the decision to surrender and, so, continued to fight into the following day. Eventually, after realizing they were outnumbered after coming under heavy fire from the Yakumo and Iwate, 
Captain Mikluka decided to scuttle the ship. The Ushakov capsized at the hands of its own crew, and Mikluka followed it below the waves. Ninety-four members of the Ushakov's crew had been killed, and 328 were taken prisoner. The survivors were supposedly given special consideration, given their refusal to surrender. Before the surrender, back on the Buony, an observer noted on the state of Rozhetsvinsky that he was sprawled in the disabled six-inch gun turret, his head wrapped round and round with a blood-stained towel, nodding on his chest. Drifting in and out of consciousness, the admiral continued giving orders. The Buony was now running low on fuel, but, by chance, was met by three surviving Russian ships. Rozhetsvinsky decided that he should be transferred to the destroyer Bedovi, which had sufficient coal to reach Vladivostok. The Bedovoy then headed northwards. Rozhetsvinsky again fell into a coma. He was in a critical condition, and any violent movement could have killed him. As well as coal, everything that could burn on the Bedovi was used as fuel and it sprinted towards Vladivostok at 22 knots, accompanied by the destroyer Grozny. However, on the morning of May 28th, two Japanese destroyers caught up with the Bedovi. The ship's captain asked de Cologne if they should increase speed and try to evade capture. De Cologne, concerned for the Admiral's life, replied no. The Red Cross and Parley flags were raised above the Bedovi as the Grozny separated and made its own attempt at escape. Historian Alastair Horn described the scene. A Japanese officer, Lieutenant Ayiba, leaped aboard Bedovi, unsheathing his sword and declaring, I am now in command of the ship. Simonov, the only member of the staff aboard the destroyer who could speak Japanese, explained that the Russian commander-in-chief was below, but in no condition to be disturbed. Ayiba apparently could not comprehend the extent of his capture. The fleet commander aboard so insignificant a craft. Nevertheless, efficiently and with notable dignity, Bedovi, bearing the stricken Rozhetsvinsky, was towed into the Japanese port of Sasebo on the morning of 30 May. Rozhetsvinsky was then interned in a hospital, and a Russian surgeon was able to remove the fragments of skull from his brain and stabilize his condition. A few days later, the Russian admiral had recovered some of his strength, and Admiral Togo visited him in the hospital. Togo at first apologized for the absence of comforts due to such a distinguished patient. He went on to say that there was no need to associate an honorable defeat with shame. Defeat is a common fate of a soldier. There is nothing to be ashamed of in it. The only question is whether or not we have performed our duty. He said that Rozhetsvinsky's men had fought most gallantly, and I admire them all, and you in particular. You performed your great task heroically until you were incapacitated. I pay you my highest respects. Togo himself was surprised at the total nature of his victory. Later, he would recall how his battleships took years of labor to design and build, and yet they were only used for half an hour of decisive battle. With Admiral Togo's staff during the visit to the hospital was a 21-year-old flag lieutenant, one Isoroku Yamamoto. He had lost two fingers during the battle and would later command the Imperial Japanese Navy during the Second World War. In an interview with a French reporter, Rozhetsvinsky said that, 
During the first half hour, our men fought well, but suddenly became demoralized by the terrifying effects of the Japanese fire, and all was then over. I was literally enveloped in flames. A Japanese observer came to a similar conclusion. After the first 20 minutes, the Russians seemed suddenly to go all to pieces, and their shooting became wild and harmless. During the Battle of Tsushima, which lasted from the early hours of May 27th to the morning of the 28th, the Russian Navy had lost 4,830 men killed, 5,907 taken prisoner, and 1,000 862 interned in neutral ports. The Japanese Navy had lost 117 killed and 583 wounded. Three Japanese torpedo boats were sunk and a number of ships, including the Mikasa, were heavily damaged but repairable. Of the 42 ships of the Russian 2nd Pacific Fleet that originally set out on their journey, seven months earlier, only three managed to reach Vladivostok, the cruiser Almaz, the destroyer Bravi, and the destroyer Grozny, which had evaded the Japanese ships during Rozhetsvinsky's capture. After the day's events, Russia had gone from owning the third largest navy in the world to the sixth on June 8th, Tsar Nicholas II telegraphed Admiral Rozhetsvinsky, thanking him. And all the members of your squadron who have loyally fulfilled your duty in battle to Russia and myself. May God console all of us. While Rozhetsvinsky was recovering as a prisoner of war in a Japanese hospital, he was dishonorably discharged from the Russian Admiralty. The following year, in December 1906, trials began in St. Petersburg to determine blame for the defeat at Tsushima. The accused totaled 78 admirals, officers, and staff. Rozhetsvinsky appeared to the proceedings in civilian clothes and took full responsibility for events. We were just not strong enough, and God gave us no luck. However, given that he was unconscious at the time of surrender, Rozhetsvinsky was exonerated and allowed to retire with a pension. This was despite Rozhetsvinsky's insistence that the decision to surrender was his own alone and that he demanded to appear at further trials as both a witness and a defendant. Captain Clapier de Cologne and three other members of Rozhetsvinsky's staff were sentenced to death. With Rozhetsvinsky acquitted and Felkerzam dead, the role of high-ranking scapegoat befell Admiral Nabogatov. Nabogatov was tried under Article 354 of the 1899 Russian Military Maritime Law for surrendering four battleships. In his defense, Nabogatov told the court, I am not by any means a soft-hearted man, and I assure you that I would not have hesitated to have sacrificed 50,000 men if it could have been of the least use. But, in this case, why should I sacrifice the lives of young men? It would only have been suicide. If I had said, Ivan, drown yourself. Petrov, shoot yourself. Nikolai, blow your brains out. They would have done so. But what right had I to sacrifice their lives to no purpose? Nabogatov, his staff, and three ship captains were sentenced to death by firing squad on December 25, 1906. In response, the Admiral declared, According to the judges who have sentenced me to a shameful punishment, I should have blown the ships up on the high seas and caused the death of 2,000 men in a few seconds. For what reason? Perhaps in the name of St. Andrew's flag, symbol of Holy Russia?
a great country must preserve her dignity and life of her sons and not send them to death on ancient vessels in order to hide her errors, intellectual blindness, and ignorance of the most elementary principles of naval matters. Over an eight-month period, a thousand more people were sentenced to death. Clapier de Cologne's sentence to die and a number of others were later commuted to ten years in prison following clemency on the part of Tsar Nicholas. Nebogatov would be fully pardoned and released in 1909. In 1886, Japan adopted the 1864 Geneva Convention, which established the humane treatment of prisoners captured during a time of war. However, during the 1894-95 First Sino-Japanese War, there was international outcry over the Japanese treatment of Chinese combatants and non-combatants. Admiral Togo, then a captain, had ordered his ship to fire at Chinese lifeboats, and General Nogi's forces had massacred Chinese soldiers and civilians following the initial capture of Port Arthur. Even during the peace negotiations, there was an assassination attempt on the Chinese representative, Li Hongzhang, who was shot in the cheek by a member of the Japanese public. Li survived the attempted assassination, but all these events put a strain on the relations between Japan and the world powers. In 1899, Japan then attended the Hague Peace Conference and again signed and recognized the rights and humane treatment of prisoners of war. During the war with Russia, Japanese forces would capture 79,454 prisoners of war. 63,243 came from the Russian army and 16,211 from the navy. 72,418 would be held in camps throughout the Japanese home islands. And the remaining 7,036 either died shortly after being captured or were released. It was not uncommon for Russian officers to be permitted to return home, provided they took an oath swearing they would not rejoin the war, although many officers willingly entered captivity to stay alongside their men. In Japan, there were 29 prison camps in total. The largest was in Hamadera, near Osaka, which, in April 1904, held 28,174 men. At the same time, Kanazawa held 5,580, Matsuyama 4,043, and Fukuoka Meiji and Sendai between 2 and 3,000. For the most part, the Russian prisoners were treated well by Japan. In 1904, the Japanese Prisoner of War Information Bureau was founded and its strict rules and code of conduct were enforced. Russian prisoners were permitted to walk throughout the towns and shop at local stores, which provided the Japanese population with its first large-scale interaction with foreigners. The British medical attaché William McPherson wrote of a POW camp in Matsuyama. The nursing staff in charge of the ward are of the Red Cross Society. The medical officers are Army medical officers of the regular service or reserve. The senior is the professor of surgery at the Army Medical School, who has only recently returned from Berlin to take up his appointment. His surgical work is admirable, equal to the best in European operative work. The Japanese authorities are, therefore, giving the Russian wounded the best surgical treatment that can be had. He went on. All the patients were kept very clean, comfortably clothed, and appeared to be on excellent terms with their guards and attendants. 
the Red Cross Society had a Japanese staff member at each of the improvised hospitals who spoke Russian and acted as interpreter. A Russian prisoner who spoke German acted as an interpreter between the wounded at the garrison hospital and the surgeon in charge. The medical officer of the Red Cross Hospital for the naval patients himself spoke Russian. By 1904, the Red Cross Society in Japan was the largest in the world and numbered almost one million members. This popularity was in large part due to the involvement of the Japanese royal family, with Emperor Meiji attending Red Cross meetings and Empress Haruko campaigning to raise funds. A major aspect of the Red Cross was the employment of women nurses who would treat wounded on the front and at home during the war with Russia. As well as Japanese nurses, the Japanese Red Cross hosted a number of nurse groups from other countries, including the U.S., Britain, France, and Germany. The American doctor Anita Newcomb McGee wrote, I maintain that a people whose men progress without its women is like a man trying to walk vigorously with one foot free while the other is wrapped in confining bandages. That the Japanese are beginning to appreciate this became evident in various ways. The women of this country have taken a great step in advance. Since the war began in finding how much they can do in public and private which before they never dreamed possible for them. The high quality treatment provided to enemy POWs also had a political aspect. The war with Russia was framed as an opportunity for Japan to prove itself as a modern and civilized nation in the eyes of the Western powers. And the humane treatment of prisoners was part of this effort. Women nurses also emphasized modernity and a break away from the rigid, gendered, feudal system. Japan aimed to keep the good faith of the British and American press and governments in order to help finance the war, as well as maintain the Anglo-Japanese alliance. The humane treatment of prisoners also helped prevent another triple intervention at the war's end by calming Western anxieties over a yellow peril. And during the fighting in Manchuria, the Japanese army issued posters depicting leisurely captivity in an effort to persuade Russian soldiers to surrender. Russia had also signed the Geneva Convention in 1867, and later it had been Tsar Nicholas II who proposed the Hague Peace Conference which Russia signed in 1899. When war first broke out, there were a few thousand Japanese nationals living in Siberia. These Japanese people living in Russia were then forcibly relocated away from the front, first to Chita in Siberia, and later further westward following an order from Viceroy Alexeyev. During the war, 2,088 Japanese prisoners would be held in Russia, 1,602 from the army, 24 from the navy, and 462 non-combatants, mostly crewmen from the Japanese merchant fleet. 44 prisoners of war died shortly after being captured, and 44 were released. Japanese prisoners were initially sent to camps in Siberia, particularly Tomsk, but were later relocated further west to a camp in Medved, about 300 miles southeast of St. Petersburg in rural Russia. For the most part, Japanese prisoners were treated well by Russia and were allowed to go shopping at local stores with their monthly allowance of 50 rubles. In January 1905, the American consul petitioned Russia to release the Japanese non-combatants in accordance with the Geneva Convention, to which the Russian government accepted and the prisoners were released. 
The relatively low number of Japanese prisoners of war can be attributed to the fact that most battles ended in a Japanese tactical victory. It also suggests that the Japanese philosophy of Bushido, which stood against surrender in principle and was part of school and military education, played a role, with many captured Japanese officers committing suicide. However, the extent of Bushido's influence is difficult to determine and there were no official rules in place that prohibited surrender or legal action taken against those who did. On the battlefields, at a local level, temporary truces and ceasefires amongst Russian and Japanese troops occurred, usually in order to bring in the wounded and dead or collect water. Despite the carnage seen in the battles, there was a large amount of mutual respect. In contrast, however, far more brutality was inflicted by the warring troops on the neutral Chinese population, whether in the looting of towns and cities or in reprisals for spying, banditry, or the accusation of assisting the enemy. Neutral Koreans could also be executed when found or accused of engaging in hostile acts against Japanese occupation. Japanese troops found spying could also be executed. Following the victory of the Japanese army at Mukden in early March 1905, the first steps of bringing about an end to the war were taken. At Mukden, of the more than 267,000 men of the Japanese army that took part in the largest battle in world history, over 75,000 had become casualties. There were reports of increased deserters from the Japanese army crossing over to Russian lines. Those unwilling to be thrown into the bloody maelstrom again, a sign that Japanese morale was waning under the strain of heavy losses. At the same time, following the Battle of Mukden, the Russian army in Manchuria had lost 89,000 troops. However, General Lineevich, who had replaced Kuropatkin, still had roughly 200,000 troops at his command marching northwards to Siping Kai, halfway to Harbin, where around 20 trains a day were arriving with between 60 and 100 cars full of troops. In a dispatch to the Tsar, the newly appointed general wrote, We occupy an admirably fortified position. The wet weather has hitherto prevented me from taking the offensive, but now our losses at Mukden have not only been made good and that we have been reinforced by a fresh army corps from Europe. I feel myself able to do more than hold my own against the enemy. Russia still had around two million troops and trained reserves yet to be deployed in Manchuria. At Laoyang and Mukden, the Japanese generals had attempted a decisive victory to completely neutralize and defeat the Russian armies in the field. However, this objective had proved elusive as every battle turned into a slog, wherein Oyama and the Japanese commanders were forced to throw in every available reserve. Casualties mounted with little strategic gain as the Russians chose to withdraw from the battlefields. The war was becoming one of attrition, and Russia was far better suited to endure its pains. British Times correspondent Francis Brinkley, a confidant of Japanese Chief of Staff Kodama Gentaro, sworn to secrecy, supposedly told his son on his deathbed in 1912 that immediately following the Battle of Mukden, General Kodama rushed back to Tokyo to urge the government to seek peace. General Kodama, in many ways the architect of the war, 
told the vice chief of the Imperial General Staff, Nagaoka Gaishi, I have come to Tokyo for the express purpose of stopping the war. If you light a fire, you must also know how to put it out. On March 13th, three days after victory, General Oyama contacted the Imperial headquarters, informing them of the difficulty of continuing the war. Although Japan still had another 700,000 reservists to be called upon, the main issue was financing the war. For 14 months, 53% of the country's annual budget was being spent on the conflict, and 52 million pounds had been lent from America and Britain at a rate of 6 to 4.5% interest. Supply demands were massive. For example, the Japanese Central Medical Depot recorded 660 million tuberculosis pills, 8.6 million bandages, 6 million units of salicylate, 3.7 million units of morphine, 800,000 units of cocaine, 500,000 units of bismuth and opium, and 136,400 pounds of cotton wool. At this point in the war, maintaining the Japanese fleet and armies in the field was costing around 51 million present-day dollars per day. General Kodama believed that an outright defeat of Russia was impossible, and to be drawn further and further into Manchuria and Siberia would result in fewer gains and larger risks. Vladivostok had recently been fortified with 85,000 men, 2,000 large guns, 400 million rifle rounds, and enough food for two years. The prospect of a siege following the bloodshed at Port Arthur seemed daunting. Admiral Togo's fleet was running low on British imported coal, and the rifled barrels of the battleships were becoming worn with use. It was believed that, given Japanese victories in the field, they would be named victors, and in turn, Russia would pay an indemnity, a financial reimbursement to cover the costs of fighting and an acknowledgement of defeat. Just as the Qin had been forced to pay 311 million yen following their defeat in 1895, a present-day value of around $8 billion. Many Russians wondered why they were fighting for what was referred to as the Wild Far East. Although Russia was better suited to absorb the impact of attrition, there was still an impact. The war was costing millions to undertake. The loss of 1,000 480 guns had cost 67 million present-day dollars, confiscated merchant vessels and their cargo another 67 million, the sinking of the Pacific and Baltic fleets around 1 billion, and the maintenance and protection of the Trans-Siberian Railway over 10 billion. Defeat after defeat, especially at Mukden, meant foreign investors, particularly in France, were hesitant to issue loans to Russia until a peace treaty was signed. However, the Russian economy, like the country, was vast and could survive the expenditure, unlike Japan. Whereas the Japanese statesmen felt pressure to bring the conflict to a close from want of money and resources, the Japanese home front remained resolute. Following the Battle of Mukden, the Times wrote, The crowning victory of Mukden was won, first and foremost because the statesmen of Japan had the spirit and the backbone to declare war at their own hour. It was won because Japan was united in the attainment of national aims and shrank from no sacrifice to secure it, because the moral forces within the nation doubled and trebled material strength 
because all was prepared, weighed, studied, known, because the shortcomings of the enemy, which were many, were recognized and profited by, because a general staff, framed on the best existing model, was able to direct all forces to a common end, because each soldier and seaman knew and understood the part he had to play, and played it wholeheartedly for his country, regardless of his own unimportant fate, and late, but not least, because the offensive in naval war was the beginning and middle and end of national strategy. General Kuropotkin would later write, We overlooked patriotic spirits which prevailed with the Japanese people. We underestimated a school system to bring up children as patriots of their motherland as its future protectors and defendants. We ignored their pride and reverence for the army. We did not take into consideration an iron discipline in the armed forces. We did not pay much attention to samurais. We absolutely misperceived the agitation against us in public opinion after we had deprived the Japanese of their earlier victory over China. On the reaction of the Japanese home front to the loss of two battleships, the Yashima and Hatsusa, back in May 1904, British naval observer William Pakenham wrote of the Japanese belief. Of the insignificance of the individual life when compared with the welfare of the state, of the unimportance of the death of tens, hundreds, or even thousands, the insignificance of the unit that has enabled Japan to bear without a murmur, almost without a word, a blow that would have shaken any other country to its foundations. A Russian soldier in his memoirs recalled that, the campaign in Manchuria revealed more clearly than all previous armed clashes that war had ceased to be the concern just of the army, but had turned into one for the whole nation, the nation at arms. From this point of view, you will see that the Japanese exemplified like-mindedness and collective sacrifice. The emperor's military headquarters were moved from Tokyo to Hiroshima, closer to where troops would embark to and return from the front, and the Empress Hiroko made bandages to be sent to the front. These Empress-made bandages supposedly held healing powers, and were first used by officers, then disinfected and used again by the lower ranks. The British medical attaché William G. McPherson quoted Japanese General Oshima as stating that the men know that they are fighting for the independence of their country. McPherson went on to discuss the entertainment in the Japanese camps, how the plot and action of all plays turned upon men's duty to their country, emphasizing the fact that everything, including life, must be given up, if required, for it and the emperor. Even still, the mounting casualties did take their toll, as Japanese surgeon Doihara Michida wrote, It makes me so angry to read about the so-called honorable war death in the newspapers. As long as human beings are alive, we find no one who finds happiness in death and sadness in being alive. Everyone likes to return without being dead. However, journalists write as those soldiers like to die. It's outrageous. On battlefields, we accept the fact that we may get hit by bullets and that we may die from wounds in the course of fulfilling our duty. Absolutely nobody looks forward to dying. There are those who talk bigger than me, just as much as there are those who are more cowardly than I am. In any case, there is no difference in terms of how we are all frightened by bullets. <laughs>
In the first half of the 19th century, the Prussian general and military theorist Karl von Clausewitz wrote on the topic of Napoleon's failed invasion of Russia and concluded that we maintain that the 1812 campaign failed because the Russian government kept its nerve and the people remained loyal and steadfast. This was not the case in 1905. The Russian captain Ryabinin lamented how in the very beginning of war there might have been aroused a wave of national enthusiasm, but the authorities could neither develop it nor animate a dormant interest in war. As early as March 1904, the Russian Social Democrats pushed a manifesto stating that the selfish interests of the bourgeoisie and the capitalists who, in their profit hunting, would sell and ruin their country, have provoked war, bringing numberless evils to the working people. On June 16th, that same year, Nikolai Bobrikov, the Russian governor general of Finland, was assassinated by Finnish nationalist Eugene Schaumann. On June 29th, a thousand socialist workers marched through the streets of Warsaw proclaiming war against war and down with czarism. The New York Times reported, the policemen not only made no attempt to stop the procession, but they moved out of its way. Some even took off their caps. On June 28th, Vyacheslav von Plave, the Russian Minister of the Interior, was assassinated when a bomb was thrown into his carriage by the socialist revolutionary Yegor Sasanov. While most Russian subjects were eligible for conscription, those with a criminal record or without a permanent residence were disqualified. This allowed revolutionaries to maintain a presence on the home front. In 1904, the wheat crop in some regions of the Ukraine failed. Referred to as the empire's breadbasket, the low harvest was exacerbated by the military occupation of all major railways. On January 2, 1905, the Australian newspaper The Age published that the traffic on the railways in Poland and other districts of Russia, where army reserve men are being dragged from their homes and forced to Manchuria, has, for some weeks past, been much interrupted. The official explanation of these interruptions is that they were due to snowstorms. But unofficially, it is stated that the cause is the destruction of railway bridges by the relatives of reserve men, who either show their resentment in this fashion, or who hope, by blocking the railways, to prevent the drafting off of reservists. Later, on January 14th, 1905, following the fall of Port Arthur, the conservative Russian newspaper New Times published that it is no longer possible to live this way. That same day, the revolutionary Vladimir Lenin wrote how the czarist military was a beautiful apple rotten at the core. There was a strike in Warsaw that led to 90 deaths, and on January 17th, the city was declared to be in a state of siege. On January 21st, striking workers caused the Russian capital of St. Petersburg to lose both electricity and newspapers. The following day, Bloody Sunday occurred, as 200 protesters were killed and 800 wounded. In an effort to petition the Tsar for improved working conditions and a national parliament, the event's leading figure, the priest, Father Gregory Gapon, as he stood amongst the day's dead, supposedly cried out, There is no God anymore. There is no Tsar. Bloody Sunday inspired a further 414,000 workers to strike throughout the month of January. On February 17, 1905, Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich, son of Tsar Alexander II, 
brother to Tsar Alexander III, and uncle to Tsar Nicholas II, who had recently resigned as Governor General of Moscow in the face of public discontent, was assassinated. He was blown up by a bomb whilst entering the Kremlin in his carriage. His wife, the Grand Duchess Elizabeth, helped to gather the blasted remnants of his body. The assassination was carried out by Ivan Kalyayev, a member of the Socialist Revolutionary Party, who was arrested and hung two months later. Following the assassination, Nicholas made vague promises on an elective Duma, a parliamentary body to give counsel to the Tsar. But this half-hearted response to events only alarmed conservatives while failing to satisfy reformers. In March, all universities and higher academic institutions were closed for the year in an attempt to combat radical students. That same month, railway strikes throughout the country and in the capital meant government ministers had to visit the Tsar by boat. As a result of the uprisings, the Russian Interior Ministry determined that military call-ups were impossible in 32 of the 50 provinces of European Russia. And on May 1st, Labor Day demonstrations in Warsaw resulted in another 30 workers being shot. June 4th saw 5,000 demonstrators clash with police outside the imperial residence at Zarko Selo, south of St. Petersburg. The former mayor of Baku announced, By rising, let us show respect for the victims. Down with the war. We had had enough blood. However, around the same time, ethnic violence erupted between Armenians and Azerbaijanis throughout the Caucasus, and massacres were perpetrated by both sides. Later that day, the U.S. minister in Berlin cabled Washington, describing the opinion of Kaiser Wilhelm. When the truth is known in St. Petersburg in regard to the recent defeat, the life of the Tsar will be in danger, and the gravest disorders likely occur. Two days later, the New York Times published, Conditions in Russia are overshadowing the war. There is fear of revolution. On June 14th, crew members of the Potemkin, a battleship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, complained to their commanding officers of maggots in their food. Eventually, the disagreement turned violent, and one of the sailors, Grigory Vakulinchuk, was shot and killed by the commanding officer, Ippolit Giliarovsky. In response to Vakulinchuk's death, the crew mutinied. Giliatovsky was killed as well as seven other officers. The mutinying crew established a People's Committee and elected Afanasy Matushenko as their leader. A red flag was raised above the ship as it headed for Odessa in the Ukraine. There were protests and riots taking place in Odessa at the time, and the Potemic fired upon the theater, a building supposedly used for military meetings. The riots turned bloody as Cossacks tried to quell the unrest. Eventually, the bloodshed culminated in a pogrom against the city's Jewish population.